it's showing we are you are live now ma'am yeah uh, a very good evening to one and all of you for a yet another very interesting uh, webinar uh, pediatric ophthalmology panorama and you are going to be seeing an array of uh, surgical procedures and so much of learning is going to evolve in the next two and a half hours we are truly lucky to have a very learned set of expert panel and i'm sure we're going to have the most uh, active in discussions going on following each of the speakers and we have a great set of speakers so that is what makes the webinar and i'm going to start introducing our very interesting expert panel we have on our panel dr meenakshi who's a chief medical officer and um, Uh, chief of pediatric ophthalmology and adult strabismus services at the Arvind Eye Care Systems based at uh, Tirunelveli we have on our expert panel dr sumita agarkar who is a deputy director of the department of pediatric ophthalmology and uh, strabismus from shankar netralaya chennai we have with us on board dr rohit saxena who is a professor of ophthalmology uh, all india institute of medical sciences and a member arc for the second term and a truly popular figure not just as a strabismologist but as a ophthalmologist of the country we have with us dr abhadan khan amitava who is a professor of strabismology from aligarh muslim uh, university and we have with us dr pandey who was the professor of ophthalmology at mams mamsi and uh, recently he's become the adjunct professor of ophthalmology at esic medical school at faridabad and he has served as an editor strabismus and pediatric ophthalmology society of our country and is currently this awesome secretary to this society moderating with me is dr veena who is the chief of pediatric ophthalmology and adult strabismus services located at arvind eye care systems from pondicherry and i'm sure she's going to whirl you around and ensure that this every minute of this two and a half hours remains useful and we shall start without any ado on to our speakers our first speaker to open up this very interesting webinar is dr ravi chandra who is the senior anesthetist at arvind eye care systems located at madurai and he is going to talk on some very essential topic anesthesia and pediatric of pediatric ophthalmology and it's i think it's critical for us to understand this before we move on to the more uh, deeper segments of pediatric ophthalmology so on to you dr ravi chandra let's hear from you uh, one minute uh, yeah that's fine Okay. One minute. I have a small lens. You, yeah, yeah. One minute. The screen sharing is not up to that my stands. Yeah, it's fine. Is it okay now? Yeah, it's okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, good evening, and everybody. And I am very happy to be with you. That is the most important persons in my life because I have been with the ophthalmology group for quite long time in the sense. maybe around 24 years this year i am completing my 24 years of work with ophthalmology in that i am very much pleased because i see no anesthesiologist role in majority of the time with the pediatric people so i sincerely thank you for everybody for giving me this wonderful opportunity to talk to you something which is relevant to you coming to this uh, pediatrics i can say that children or not this miniature of the adult before going to the anesthesia proper we should understand some of the basic uh, things their vagal parasympathetic tone is more dominant sympathetic systems is different and adrenal stores also very different okay yeah the adrenal stores are very high and 
the infants and the neonates especially when they go for bradycardia during the procedure they will usually go for immediate cardiac decrease in cardiac output and arrest these are all the some of the events which everybody have to be very panic in the operation theater so i just want to know to share this first next is the pediatrics and priorities why i am saying the pediatrics in ophthalmology there are lot of list in this ot i used to say the pediatric patients has to be given priorities because the dehydration is one of the poorly tolerated by the pediatrics because their surface area is large so they they go for easily dehydration if the programmed starvation periods is exceeding and they usually go for hypoglycemia which is not even the patients of diabetic but even for the newborn neonates they will usually go for hypoglycemia if the starvation period is high so if the hypoglycemia is going very high less than 45 mg per cent we used to give 5% dextrose this is very important why i am saying the baby is usually in the mother's lap without knowing that the baby is going for hypoglycemia they don't show any reactions of hypoglycemia silently the baby will go for sleep the hypoglycemia usually unusual unless there is hydrogenic growth is in infusion of the iv fluids and the next important thing is the baby Is Could you switch off your video? So, uh, yeah, si signal is not strong, Doctor Ravi Chander. Is the hypothermia? Pardon, I didn't get you. No, I thought. Hello. I thought your signal Hello. was a little weak. Uh, is it okay. for me only or for everybody? I am not sure. Yes, Madam. The signal is weak. So then, maybe you could switch off your is it, video. Switch off your video. Is it right now? It's all right now. Yes. Is it better now? Yeah, I'm better. just walking into the. Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah, it's better now. <laughs> Thank you. Dehydration is one of the poorly tolerated by the any pediatric patients. The premature infants, especially, go for the insensible loss of large surface area of the body, and usually they will go for dehydration. I ask everybody to give priorities, and then the hypoglycemia is the next common important factor because the blood sugar level goes down if the patient starvation is exceeding especially when the blood sugar goes below 45 mg per cent and it, it would be very dangerous if the patient goes into the hypoglycemia especially in the mother's lap the mother usually thinks that it is because the baby is sleeping it is quiet 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 very careful so the next important thing is hypothermia i usually say the hypothermia and the hypoglycemia are the major dangerous or killers of the babies especially neonates when you are taking up for the cases yeah according to the uh, american society of anesthesiology classification there are four um, classification has been uh, developed the one is the normal healthy patient and the next asa2 we used to say a patient with the mild systemic diseases without substantiate functional limitations that means these two areas only we are very much interested very much focused we never or we normally we don't go beyond this limit a healthy patient or a, a diseased patient with a minimal systemic diseases and that who have been very much under control it is not that patient who is otherwise going to die or the patient is with the surgery this going to patient is going to survive these type two areas which we are normally don't take the cases so the anesthesia plan what we used to do this there is no anesthesia technique is 100% say i have to say like that and as far as your pediatric surgery is concerned there is no surgery without anesthetist that means anesthetist is not 100% safe so we have to be very careful in choosing the patient and formulate the protocol and plan accordingly the expected complications some of the complication which usually we come across is the bradycardia or hypothermia or hypoglycemia that we have to discuss and the plan accordingly and then do the procedure and we used to discuss with the team members especially the surgeon or the nursing system to educate them and teach what are all unexpected complication that can happen because as i sense as i said earlier the things which worsen the condition of the baby is 
very, very narrow margin. So we have to be very careful in and discussing and selecting the patients. The limitations of this and modify the anesthesia technique is also very careful because sometimes the surgeons feel that has to be done for one hour or two hours, something like that. Depends on the patient general condition, we have to modify and plan accordingly. So what is the preoperative assessment? Usually the 90% of the cases are usually a straightforward. The patient comes with the very walking into the theater or the parents are not very much you know, understanding of the seriousness of the anesthesia because the surgery is going to happen in a patient who is otherwise looks healthy. They don't have that uh, difficulty of pain or they don't have the vomiting sensation, fever, nothing will happen. So they usually a yeah, straightforward cases and we have to approach the patient in a very different way. Sometimes the babies or they are not expressing too much on the others. So we approach the patient and we have to see the patient, what are all the syndromes. Sometimes, as you know, the difficulty intubation, the patient is the one of the major problem in the pediatric patient, especially the head is large and the tongue is very big and other syndromes which limit the airway, which is very, very important for the anesthesia to do. The major problem, what I have observed in this age group or is the cardiac and neurological status. Usually it is very difficult to identify because the baby may not express their uh, problem and the cry is the only exchange between the parents and the children and uh, parents and the anesthetist or the surgeon. So we have to examine very carefully. Most of the time the cardiac problem may be very mild, usually a, a silent ASD or VSD or some neurological factors is the developmental delay because we don't be able to find the sum of the problem. So we have to assess the patient in such a way there should not be any post-operative problem during that period. So what is the focus? What is the interest of this anesthesia per se is to increase, minimize, okay, increase, minimize increase in IOP, causing OCR, preventing the nausea vomiting. So what I do, the anesthesia is induction with the propofol and the fluorine and the fentanyl, neuromuscular blockade, usually the non-depolarizing muscle relaxation. The quieter is the better achieved with non-depolarizing relaxation and the controlled ventilation. I prefer LMA, which controls the IOP and all your requirement of the surgical procedures. See, the post-operative period, the patient has to be given some form of local anesthetic agents or block to prevent the baby to be very comfortable sleeping like this. And there are parastomal infusion is available nowadays. And if the patient is big enough to give intramuscular injection, we can give a block. And once the patient is recovered, oral suspension also very useful. This is the uh, ocular cardiac reflux. I don't want in detail because this Ragaldoni sky, if the patient goes for bradycardia less than 60, we can give atropine or glycoperlate. And uh, once the patient is comes normal, we can proceed the next surgery. See, nausea vomiting, I feel the on certain dexamethasone combination will reduce the incidence of vomiting. And especially after the giving the propofol, the, the incidence has been very much decreased. So sometimes the systemic drops, what we are using, the dilating drops, can produce tachycardia and hypertension. Some of the beta blockers which used for control of uh, glaucoma can give the bradycardia and bronchospasm. The electrical imbalance is uh, when uh, the uh, inhibitors are used. So some of the EU and the laser in ROP surgery, what I always require my uh, surgeon is to give the subtenance block before doing this uh, procedure. Thereby it limit this uh, uh, problem of the uh, baby induced tachycardia is very much reduced. So these are all the issues that commonly we discuss with the surgeon, the use of adrenaline. Usually the adrenaline is the one requirement by the surgeon. Previously, I never had, but of late, everybody is asking the use of adrenaline. But at the same time, we are also upgraded from the halothin, which is very dangerous for the adrenaline. Now, the use of sevoflurane, unless the patient is some cardiac compensated patient, decompensated patient, the adrenaline can be used with a caution. And the positive pressure is the one which is always demand from the surgeon. The deep plane of anesthesia definitely will do the wonder. And the ideal time to measure the IOP, if you ask me, before the patient manipulated in the orotracheal fascia or by any muscle relaxation, just sleeping dose of uh, any propofol or any metazolam and then do the procedure. And IOP is usually raised in coughing and uh, vomiting. So anesthesia has to be well managed in a such a way the patient should not cough in the end of the procedure and vomiting. We don't know how much damage will create inside the eye. There is no proof so far, but there are happenings which in the traumatic patients and 
I always insist my surgeon to use the local anesthetic at the end so that the patient will be very comfortable at the end. The sedation role always be questioned because if the patient is asleep, I am comfortable. If the patient is too much asleep, the parents will be asking why the patient is not waking up. So the more important thing is give anesthesia in a quiet eye for a comfortable for the surgeon is very important. Thank you. I think I have completed in time because of this uh, internet problem. I could not be able to do little early. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And a very interesting talk, uh, Dr. Ravichandar, because there's always so much we need uh, while we are with the uh, anesthetist. And uh, I'm going to ask you a simple question and I look forward to Veena and the other expert panel asking some more. A role yeah. of uh, topical anesthesia with the uh, intravenous mm. conscious sedation and strabismology surgery and how young would a patient have to be to do this? Yeah, that's one. Uh, I did one study with the intravenous uh, propofol infusion with uh, xylacan jelly uh, for a patient. We used to do with the age group of 12 and above. The patient has to be a little more cooperative for the procedure and we can give uh, propofol infusion at the rate of 6 microgram, 6 milligram per kilogram per hour and then apply the xylacan jelly for half an hour before the procedure and do the procedure. We have some good results and it's fine only. Okay. Uh, Veena? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, sir, one uh, the thing. Uh, in dental procedures, they're using this con uh, conscious sedation of nitrous and oxygen. As yes. Way, if in uncooperative children for procedures, they're using. Uh, yes. What about that in our practice, sir? We are not doing it, but... Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've also heard... That's right. and midazolam being used. Yes, yes, yes. What, what the most important thing is... The titrated doses. See, as you know, you are occupying the major head end. See, the airway is also nearby. So, the titrated dose of fentanyl and metazolam or with nitrous oxide oxygen flow through the nozzle and do the procedure is possible. Only thing is how much effective you are giving the analgesic doses in the form of either naught or in the form of uh, local drops. And the patient has to be pain free during the because sedation is not an alternate for the surgical procedure anesthesia procedure, but it will make the patient comfortable because as she said, conscious sedation is, doesn't mean there's nitrous oxide oxygen alone. As she said, this fentanyl and metazolam also is a very useful combination, but only thing is how titrated, how safely you are conducting the anesthesia procedures for the safety of the respiration. Yes, true. Very relevant. Uh, uh, can what? you tell us how to manage the case of homocystinuria preoperatively and postoperatively? Yeah, right. Nice question. Because nowadays, uh, I have the interest of asking all the congenital dislocated patients to do the, uh, what is called this uh, homocysteine level test. If the level is above 20, it's a standard of homocysteine positive. What we do, the starvation period, we usually minimize and the six hours. Because if the starvation is prolonged, they are more prone for thromboembolic phenomena. So what you do is, we give sufficient IV fluid hydration before starting the procedure, number one. The starvation period is limited, sufficient IV fluid, and most interestingly, we started using these, stacking it in the legs, See, because the stagnation can happen in the anesthetized legs. So the thromboembolism is possible, like deep end thrombosis. We use this stacking it and compress these all the lower limb, and then proceed with the anesthesia. We have that some studies saying that nitrous oxide should be avoided, in high level of uh, uh, homocysteine level, we do with the oxygen and the high level of CO fluorine, not with nitrous oxide alone. And postoperatively, till the patient gets up, we are giving the IV fluid continuously. The patients are doing well. So far, we didn't face any mortality, something like that. Yeah. I missed something which you said for deep in what target? What was it? I didn't hear that. Yeah, way. the stock in it, the stock in it, what we are applying in the legs. So, okay. the, the okay. stagnation of this, see, the yes, problem yes. with the homocysteine area is uh, thromboembolism. So, yes. these are all the areas that is more prone for that. Yes. So, we usually give the stock in it in the, both lower limbs and then proceed for anesthesia, avoid nitrous oxide and increase the CO4 to balance the nitrous oxide. So, that we completed that analysis. Yes. So, uh, how long we should do uh, pre-op prophylaxis of B12 or folate? Uh, 
combination yeah yeah actually actually nowadays uh, the folate and b12 is the one uh, treatment which is not that uh, mandatory or something there are some enzyme conversion uh, uh, tablets are available people are started using nowadays okay okay thank you that doesn't interact with anesthesia okay b12 or folate doesn't interact with anesthesia oh thank you very much dr ravichandra there was a lot of learning from your talk and we truly happy to know you in this uh, webinar uh, we shall now yeah, go thank you the... um, dr shubangi had some question oh yes dr shubangi um you are not audible you have to unmute shubangi, yes. yeah he is silent i think uh, uh, we would uh, you could stay connected we'll take that question later we'll start with the debate uh, the debate is again a very uh, interesting one uh, and we would have dr jitendra jhedani who is the director of the baroda children eye care and spint uh, clinic uh, who's a very leading pediatric ophthalmologist of our country and he is going to be talking adjustable strabismus surgery a must for precision so on to you dr jitendra thank you so much ma'am thank you for the opportunity and thank you for the nice introduction i would i am sharing my screen is it visible yes yes okay so to start with uh, i will just be speaking a little bit on what uh, are the basic principles for strabismus surgery and why adjustable strabismus surgery is uh, all the strabismus surgeons uh so the practical guideline is that we want to achieve long term stability of result uh, so we have to take into account the long term drift from post op alignment and we have to select the muscles which would uh, 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 give the chance to match junctions this is a basic practical principle of so that uh, we would like to highlight what exactly uh, and how exactly adjustable surgeries help so it allows the surgeon to place the eyes in optimal position post operatively which are suitable for optimal long term result so not necessarily uh, you know the eye will not drift or it will not can you switch off your video outcome, but yes it will give yes sir i will do that no i i cannot why not yeah yeah now maybe uh, because your signal is weak okay your slides are not seen now i will just, just uh, share the screen ma'am mm. i'm not able to share the screen no you are sharing now is it visible now uh, no it is showing you have started sh sharing no is it visible now ma'am No, not no, yet. Not yet. Yes, yeah. visible now. <clears throat> Back now. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, what the point I was trying to make was that it allows the surgeon to place the eye in an optimal position, and also the surgeon can avoid having eyes in a position post-op that is not desired. Like if you, uh, I, I would be showing the slide of uh, some of the data uh, as to what exactly I meant by this. but before that we will take up some of the some of the really strong uh, indications for surgery uh, adjustable surgery which are if you want to have a proper cosmetic alignment somebody who's actually going to get operated just for the for the sake of cosmetics although all the strabismus surgeons do make a point that it is never just a cosmetic surgery but for the cosmetic purpose from the patient's point of view if patient has a deviation which is like uh, because of the thyroid thyroid orbit uh, orbitopathy and we all know that the results would be highly unpredictable immediate post op as well as late post op if the patient has come to us for re surgery patients with double vision who want actual accurate uh, you know single vision and highly demanding patients obviously so the common arguments that we hear uh, in in normal debates are that you know we are not really comfortable to go back to or if we are doing adjustment for kids or doing adjustment in opd or sometimes you know that we don't need it as the long term deviation is not really predictable but it is predictable in short term it is similar to 
not doing or not putting an empirical IUL in pediatric cataract. I'm just giving an analogy because we do not, we cannot predict the final outcome, which does not mean that we won't be doing something which is predictable, at least in short term. And the another argument is that immediate post op does not change the long term outcome. That we will again see at the end uh, what exactly we meant by that. These are some of the basic methods with which we can do adjustable surgery, not really a point of debate. So it is just to cover uh, the adjustable surgery because bow tie technique. This is sliding uh, nose method. And then nowadays, almost all muscles we do, we can do on adjustable, adjustable hand to see uh, in around 2002, 2003. And so we have Faden surgery or Faden uh, surgery, uh, commonly known as adjustable Faden, but it is actually a recession, resection, recession surgery. So this is just to show that you know most of the surgeries now in strabismus can be performed uh, uh, with adjustment with adjustable. It gives wonderful uh, uh, it gives a wonderful outcome in the sense that at least immediate post-op outcome is well within your hands and you can easily adjust it post-op if there is an untoward incidence in the in the sense of having a large post-op drift or some surprise drift. So this was regarding the adjustable fadal. This is the data which I which I have borrowed from uh, one of my mentors, Dr. Stephen Kraft, and um, this is just to show the post-op drift in ESO and EXO. This is another study done by him, and uh, this is also present after ESO. So see, he he has not achieved orthotropy of post-op because he knows that the patients would go in for EXO deviation. And these are the results. So my point, which I'm trying to make here, is that post-op outcome, immediate post-op outcome, is in your hands, and you can adjust as much as you want to for immediate post-op. And you can think of what the final outcome would be. So uh, not really a hype. It has its own position. It is not necessarily for all the patients, but yes, specific indications do justify adjustable muscle surgery. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, madam, for the opportunity. And uh, stop sharing, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> uh, I just take one question with you, then we go on to the debate, and then we now would, of course, uh, ask <laughs> questions too. But uh, how latest have you ever scheduled an adjustment? No, we, we uh, normally post, uh, like for children, we adjust it after three hours. Okay. Now, how have you done beyond that? For adults? So, for adults, we can, uh, so it is more important and adjustable to know how late we can do it. Yes, yes. And, uh, they're not able to get patients as late as 24 hours. We're not able to hear you, Dr. Jaitani. Uh, we shall uh, we have to just uh, add your comment once your signal becomes clearer. Uh, we shall now go on to the other person on the opposite side debating, Dr. Arun Samprati, who's the director of the Samprati Eye Hospital and Spin Center and a very popular uh, person in the, the field of strabismology and in pediatric ophthalmology. And he's going to tell us that adjustment is just a hype and we need to stick to conventional. So let's hear from you, Dr. Arun. Thank you. Thank you, Rish, madam. Uh, first of all, thank you for giving me this opportunity. So the internet uh, itself has given the uh, thing that the general signals are not good. And so adjustable is not the procedure of choice. So I'll just tell you why fixed uh, suture surgery is more important and more reliable. So fixed, uh, fixed strabismal surgery or the non-adjustable suture surgery has been practiced by 95% of the strabismologists all over the world. Very few surgeons actually practice adjustable suture. So that itself is a major evidence for you to prefer non-adjustable over adjustable. So Dr. Jitendra has been hanging the muscles on a loose knot and then checking the alignment after three hours and he's adjusting the knot. This is what is adjustable suture surgery. 
the major presumptions here is one is the post op alignment on day 1 is the final result and number 2 muzzle will get attached wherever uh, he wants it to we get uh, get it attached suppose you are doing a 9 mm recession muzzle is going to attach at 9 mm so we'll see why this is not true so this is a picture like many of the patients on the first day after the surgery or even after three or four hours after the surgery eyes will be red there will be chemosis patient can hardly open the eyes so how can you judge your uh, alignment after having so much of inflammation in the eye so your judgment itself may not be correct so you are aligning the eye based on this judgment and we know that there are a lot of post op drifts uh, which is possible and uh, dr jatani has also ha highlighted that it's possible the day one alignment is not the final so we have many studies which have shown that uh, uh, at the end of 3 months you can see in this particular study the adjustable suture surgery which had 90% success rate on day one had dropped to 50% at the end of 3 months so the long term results are really questionable and the third thing is uh, dr jitendra is hanging the muzzle from the cliff so he is just putting the muzzle there and he is uh, thinking that it will get attached uh, wherever he intends it to attach but unfortunately it doesn't happen especially in long uh, recessions uh, more than 6 uh, to 8 mm uh, invariably the muzzle will creep forward uh, leading to under corrections there are a few other problems associated with adjustable suture dr vichandra sir has very nicely highlighted what are the risks of anesthesia and my friend dr jitendra wants to put the child under gi after 3 hours again so definitely it is a risky proposition and plus this is so stressful for the patient to again go to the operating room discomfort in the patient and sometimes you may have vasovagal responses there is doubling of the ot time and increased expenditure for the patient and god forbid if something happens he has put it from the cliff and suppose if this rope breaks you are drowned so this lost muscle is a dreaded complication of adjustable suture surgery besides you may have uh, problems like the conjunctival cyst or granulomas and there are a lot of scientific evidence to prove that uh, non adjustable is better so this is one of the study where a lot of studies have been done and uh, how many patients suppose if you put a patient on adjustable how often you need to adjust uh, because your nomogram is not correct so brad johnson and tell has reported that than 50% of the patient actually required adjustment in the post operative period and some studies have reported even lower figures there have been studies uh, in fact this is one of the nice review uh, published in february 2020 adjustable versus non adjustable sutures in strabismus surgery who benefits the most and here they have analyzed different various studies available uh, till date and they have found that most of the cases the statistically the uh, whatever the success rate which has been reported has not been very significant so it is the difference between the adjustable and non adjustable final alignment after 3 months has uh, no big difference between the two groups and uh, statistically the differences are not very significant so these are the various uh, studies which uh, highlight the same and there is another nice review from the cochrane study uh, again this group has analyzed various uh, studies which are available about adjustable and non adjustable and they have finally said that the uh, Uh, reliable conclusions cannot be drawn concerning which technique produces a better long term alignment or in which condition one technique is more appropriate than the other so they have not been able to say in fact they have been told that there is only one study so far uh, that too with a small numbers which has shown that adjustable is superior to the non adjustable technique and hence they have concluded that there is no evidence to say that adjustable is superior to non adjustable surgery and i would like to conclude my argument by quoting uh, one of the renowned ophthalmologists dr david hunter who says intellectually it seems logical that having a second chance to improve the outcome of strabismus surgery should increase the overall success rate and reduce the reoperation rate yet adjustable suture surgery has not gained universal acceptance partly because level 1 evidence of its advantage is lacking and partly because the learning curve for accurate decision making during suture adjustment may span a decade or more so uh, my friend dr jitendra is probably a very expert surgeon and probably he has mastered this art but i don't mm -hmm. think everyone should fall for the rosy picture dr jitendra has painted about adjustable suture surgery stick to non adjustable the triumph to a proven method and the uh, method which is followed by 94% of the strabismologist thank you thank you very much dr arun that was a good punch you gave 
no, sadly, uh, Dr. Jitendra's, I hope his network has become all right. Uh, <laughs> then how do you deal? Uh, is there something like, how would you deal with a refractive surprise if you do not use this small tool, which is there in your hands? You don't need a tool if your um, measurements are so accurate all the time? Yes, yes. Basically, it depends on our nomograms, madam. So I think uh, most important is to be confident about our own nomograms. Uh, what is the results that we are getting in uh, particular surgeries? So if you are confident about it, I'm sure uh, probably will not need that. Sir, you don't prefer handbags in post-RD surgeries with the buckle also? Yeah, probably you have to use a non adjustable suture there <laughs> so that the suture doesn't break and you don't drown. Okay. Okay. Jitendra, right. sir, how much percentage of your uh, horizontal muscles like you need to uh, readjust? Especially in case of intermittent exotropia, if you're doing adjustable, how much percentage of your patients need real adjustment? Uh, are you asking me, ma'am? Yes. Yes, sir. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't, I didn't get it. No, I don't do adjustable and intermittent exotropia, ma'am. I've never, I don't do intermittent exotropia. I just do, because most of the cases, uh, uh, my my argument was not that adjustable should be done in all the cases. I uh, I actually meant that there are specific indications. Most of the studies with Dr. Arun sir quoted were um, true and just. The, the only thing is that, you know, they all the studies which have been done are head-to-head -head studies with uh, you know, uh, intermittent exo patients or horizontal muscle surgeries. Adjustable is a surgery of choice only in specific indications. Uh, that is what I, I do. In, uh, so in routine cases, I, I don't do adjustable. There were some questions in the chat box about pediatric, uh, ca pediatric uh, cases and adjustable. Most of these patients were already operated. They were re-surgeries. Uh, patients were, you know, really bothered and concerned what will happen. And uh, most of these cases were uh, infantile esotropia, both eye MR recession uh, already recessed and they went into either consecutive exo or they were exo operated patients. Either. So most of my patients are uh, post-op resurgeries, thyroid um, uh, diplopia patients. Uh, I have uh, honestly not many patients I have done in intermittent exotropia where I have done uh, adjustable surgeries. Would you recommend uh, adjustables in thyroid eye disease? In uh, almost all the thyroid uh, eye disease, I would go for adjustable because we are really not sure what will happen post-op. This, this is a, I mean, most of us, I, I, I know Dr. Arun and uh, most of the panelists would agree that in most of the patients, we would plan to go for adjustable or at least semi-adjustable. If we are doing inferior rectus recession, uh, I would not like to go pure hangback. So I would do a, a fixed suture and put a semi-adjustable technique of Spielman or which was popularized by Kushner later. Okay, so shall, I, shall we go on to our next speaker? That was a good uh, a set of uh, debates. And, uh, Can I just you... add uh, one yes. point, ma'am? Yes. Uh, you see, I, I have done uh, some adjustable, but uh, direct per operatively, where I, I stuck the Snellen chart on the roof, and I even got the goggles, uh, you know, sterilized, and uh, under topical anesthesia. So we could actually do a cover test, uh, you know, with the, uh, the chart stuck to the roof. And I had a similar thing, thing in the clinic so that we practice with the patient so that he or she would understand what is, what is expected during the surgery. But of course, uh, I still believe that it doesn't make a difference. The outcomes are, were pretty much similar compared uh, whether we did adjustable or uh, we did fixed uh, surgery. But uh, uh, having said that, I believe that there is a little space for it in those difficult situations that uh, Dr. Jitendra pointed out now. Yes, sir. I think that's the advantage of uh, getting used to topical anesthesia. Yeah, yes, correct. Yes, yes. So we shall now go on to our next speaker, Dr. Abadhan Khan Amitava, and he's going to be, he's a professor of, uh, I'd already introduced him, and he's going to talk on a very interesting topic, the ication and old procedure reinvented. On to you, doctor. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, so without uh, further ado, I'll uh, talk about uh, ication and uh, and it's true that it is really not nothing new, but we we've, we've got it back in, uh, into action, so to speak. Um, you know, there are many options for tightening muscles. Uh, most of us are, are doing resections just straightforward. Some of us might be advancing a muscle now and then. Uh, and the tuck, the word tuck is usually used uh, goes with the superior oblique. 
plication is also a form of tucking really it's just folding a little portion of the muscle tendon complex uh, near the insertion now why i did some uh, some work on this was when we were doing and researching the uh, mojon minimally invasive strabismus surgery i was really surprised to see that most of the time uh, mojo had been was plicating and as you see the two enlarged pictures this is one day after the plication and there was uh, on the medial uh, 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 aspect of the eye and you know they the eye looked remarkably quiet they didn't show the, uh, an, any apparent bulge and the congestion were, were very very similar to any other eye and i was so impressed that i decided to go and try plication myself because uh, although i had thought of it earlier i always thought there would be three layers of muscle tendon at that point and there should be a bulge and it should uh, you know lead to some kind of uh, blemish at that point of time uh, as you can see on the left there are some advantages uh, it, it, it will cause less disruption of the anterior segment circulation and there will be lesser post operative reaction right also says that uh, which is obvious since you are doing no tenotomy there is lost muscle is, is not going to happen Uh, and there is also an option of reversibility in the immediate post-operative situation if you, for some reason, feel you less stuff. Uh, I also felt at that time that it would be obviously less bloody since we were not cutting uh, the muscles at that point of time, and uh, it shouldn't be more difficult than a resection. And it just might be a tad quicker. There would be little uh, bleeding and things like that. But as uh, Professor Pradeep Sharma uh, pointed out in his uh, uh, comments uh, on the article we published. uh there there used to be cheese wiring but that was when muscles were attached to with to the muscle tissue only while you were folding but since everybody is now doing muscle to sclera that cheese wiring is more or less over but there uh, there was always concern of some uh, uh, under correction which may lead to more reoperation and some uh, drifting off of the muscle in the long term and as these pictures show about and iris angiography on the left the pictures above is to do with the pre op and uh, the, the one below are about under 40 seconds after surgery and if you can see you'll be able to see here on the top uh, let me just take the pen color here and so you'll see here on on this portion uh, after the tenotomy side that there is an absence of uh, vascularity within 40 seconds of the surgery the pictures on the right on this side they are before uh, uh, and after uh, doing plication an absolutely fantastic uh, circulation so there is no doubt that circulation are better with with plication uh, but compared to the angiography which which is an invasive procedure the oct angiography now gives you an option which is non invasive and moreover it can be done on both the eyes uh, more or less at the same time it allows you that thing and it gives you this delightfully uh, thing which are which are numbers quadrant wise as a percentage of vascularity each quadrant wise and why i like numbers is because numbers allows great statistics so if uh, if people who have access to uh, ocular coherence tomography they can do further studies doing angiography with and without plication and as you can see in this picture uh, the one on the left is the inferior in, uh, you can see it on the inferior aspect the vascularity and this is after tenotomy on the uh, oct angiography that the vascularity has gone down now here's the here's what the options are you can either fold the muscle under the uh, uh, under the muscle muscle itself which is what a tuck would would be appropriately called you just tuck it in or the loop might hang outside on the outer aspect of the muscle we of course favored this the technique which is shown on, on top uh, we tucked it in but remember some something would be needed to uh, help fold the muscle underneath because as you tend to lift the muscle forward it tends the loop also the muscle loop itself tends to also move forward so you need to keep uh, using something to push it back and as i can sh uh, show you in these in these pictures we we took blocking bites we we, we identified the area from where we would do that the, the uh, resection we would have done took blocking bites and then in the second picture we in, in this one we took subsequent bites just ahead of the insertion and this instrument that you see here this little pipe like instrument was nothing but the intra uh, the intravenous uh, you know uh, uh, cannula the needle which had been broken off and then bent so that it formed a little uh, uh, you know uh, a useful instrument for us to push the loop underneath the muscle as we closed closed the uh, the, the suture and that's how we got the uh, the surgery done with the with the loop that means we tuck the loop under the muscle 
And as these pictures show, and we did a randomized control study with 22 in the uh, recession resection and 18 in the resection plication group, whether on the first day or the two weeks later or the six weeks later, six to eight weeks later, we found no significant dif differences in the inflammatory scores, no significant differences in the success rate. Uh, uh, even the alignment uh, change per millimeter of muscle was, was similar in the, in the two groups. Jaspreet from the PGI Chandigarh had an interesting paper on a very similar line, but they had access to the UBM and what they also did, what they did was one year later, so they had long-term follow-up, they looked for post-operative drift. Uh, so the one above is the, is the recession and the one below is the plication and they, they reported no differences in the minimum drift, there were just insignificant drifts in both the re, uh, recession group and the plication group. So there is enough evidence uh, that, that the post-operative drifts are nothing very different from recession. Uh, then I came across this. Uh, uh, you have one minute remaining, sir. Okay. In 2020, where there was a meta-analysis and with the compared uh, seven studies, uh, each of which had, be, had follow-up for beyond six months and they had comparative success rate, comparative drift rate, comparative reoperation rate. So there was, again, no real difference. Uh, so at the end, I would I still think that uh, the reset uh, the applications are at par with resection, and they particularly should be used if you're doing more than two muscle re uh, you know uh, rect rectus surgeries. Uh, right, of course, has uh, also suggested a mini plication. Uh, th there are now papers saying that you can do adjustable plication, and I'm now toying around with the idea of using plication along with certain vertical offset, uh, you know, offset. Uh, to cater to uh, some of the alphabet phenomenon when we don't need to touch the obliques. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. That was a very interesting uh, presentation. In fact, I find I'm really enjoying myself. Uh, is there uh, just one question before Veena takes on? Is there any concerns in plicating a lateral rectus? Would the resection be better in this muscle? Uh, I really haven't looked at it at that point of view because uh, when I do the plication, I find no difference really. I've done plication of the lateral rectus, uh, rectus I've done for the for the medial rectus, and I've had no issue with them. Dr. Veena? Yes. So, thank you, sir. It was a very excellent presentation. Uh, uh, in paretic squints, whether do you prefer for a plication? Uh, no, no, no. I'm not, uh, I mean, I haven't tried it out at all and I haven't thought of doing it in uh, in paralytic strips. No, ma'am. You don't know vertical recti, Dr. Amitava? No, uh, Dr. Pandit, again, um, no, I haven't uh, done plication with vertical recti. I'm largely, the, I've, I've done plenty of them, but all on horizontal recti. All right, I think. As you gain more experience, I think you can move. Maybe. Yeah. Cool. We feel like there is a small bump when you do application, is it acceptable by the patients? Sir? Absolutely. There is really no bump. I mean, you know, all my, I mean, even before I started doing this, even 20 years ago, I had thought of folding this, this muscle and I said, we can't have three layers of muscle tendon there. It wouldn't, it wouldn't work. But only when I saw Mojo's results, I realized that it actually worked. So the, you see the, 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 the uh, thing of the pudding is in the, in the eating of it. So if there is no, no bump, we don't see it. And I didn't see that. Either. The patient were equally happy. But there are concerns about long-term drift, I think. more Some uh, long-term uh, results, I think, are slightly, there's a drift, I think. But I, I quoted Jaspreet's paper. You see, uh, even a year later, they did UBM to see where the muscle was uh, after, a, uh, after a year. They yeah, again but, find no difference. But one year is a short time and the number of True. cases must be very small. Okay, so I think uh, more studies need to be done. Maybe I, mean, Santa, I would say that the past three years, I mean, I personally, and I remember Dr. Pradeep Sharma, we have virtually entirely shifted to plications. I mean, I have to actually know an indication for a section yeah. to do a resection. Otherwise, it's plication. Yes. Oh, and of course, I can't give you exact numbers, but I uh, there is no change uh, either way, increase or decrease in... Uh, you know, uh, residuals or overcorrections. There is a uh, chance of an error of either. Yes. You would have an overcorrection because you are passing the suture anterior to where you would pass in a resection. You pass it deep in the uh, stump when you do oh. resections. And here you pass anterior to the insertion. So oh, you have a risk of an overcorrection. 
and as you point out that there is a risk of a little loosening of the suture especially as now we have all gone on to doing vicryl uh, for plications instead of using ethibond which was the earlier concern so there is that little risk that it loosens up and it causes a little uh, under correction but like i said i can't give you exact figures but we haven't found uh, anecdotally any increase in either over or under corrections any uh, how 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 easy it is to reverse oh very very in fact i have gone back and reversed uh, i think my longest time when i have reversed it was i think 3 weeks or so and what about the resurgery sometimes say it's a i have re i have opened up and i have re replication i have done uh, you know year or two later It's i mean of course in resected muscle we frequently do plications but in a plicated muscle we have gone on to do a, a replication but uh, uh, opening was the concern and like i said i've done it up to 3 weeks uh, beyond that i haven't uh, thankfully got the opportunity to try no no I, what i meant was ki if you have to sometimes like resected muscle you can easily recess should there be a consecutive exo or eso uh, how easy it is that is it is it easy to recess it back with that whole uh, uh, plicated muscle uh, like I, i haven't had the experience like i said i the uh, plicated muscles i have had a opportunity to open and to replicate okay i haven't had to recess uh, i mean it was early so i haven't had something which i have to worry about so late in the post dr rohit uh, actually i have done a few this thing where i had to release the plication because there's an over correction yeah. so it actually almost works like an adjustable suture surgery itself so you can just do a small plication and if you feel there's an over correction you can easily release it and uh, one more uh, thing uh, i would like to ask dr amita i actually instead of uh, folding inwards uh, i have actually done it folding outside also in the muscle the folded muscle is on the upper part instead of going behind and i have seen no difference in the result it it, it works equally well uh, so, yeah. Not I'm sure. Good. I'm sure it works equally well because I, when I initially did uh, uh, started piloting this, uh, I mean, before I went for a formal study, so we were also leaving the loop, uh, you know, on the outer surface. You're right. I also found no difference. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, great discussion, and we shall go on to our next speaker, Dr. Shubhangi Bawe, who's a uh, uh, often uh, consultant ophthalmologist from the Drishti Eye Clinic and Spin Center, Nagpur, and she's going to talk on. Uh, Duan syndrome tips and tricks for management. On to you, Dr. Shubhangi. Uh, am I audible? Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Chitra, for asking me to be part of this uh, wonderful uh, seminar. I'll be talking on tips and tricks, uh, tricks in management of Duan's retraction syndrome. i think we'll skip this uh, slide of introduction um coming to the tips and diagnosis uh basically the prime primary uh, we need to uh, differentiate duan's retraction syndrome most commonly from six nerve palsy and the primary position uh, deviation is uh, as you can see the picture on the uh, left that there is a it is in accordance with the limitation of movement so in six nerve palsy the uh, the child uh, girl has a grade 4 abduction limitation then she has a similar amount of eso deviation in the primary position uh, but in a case of eso uh, drs as you can see on the right that primary position appearance is almost straight with a grade 4 uh, limitation uh, of abduction so uh, there is no match between the primary position deviation and the limitation of eye movement that makes us suspect whether it is a duan's retraction syndrome and then we have uh, the palpebral aperture changes marked globe retraction uh, upshoots and downshoots which again goes in favor of duan's retraction syndrome certain systemic anomalies can be associated with duans as in golden hair and klippenfell then if we uh, see these epibulbar dermoids or preauricular skin tags uh, we have to suspect that it could be a duans retraction syndrome it could be seen in families and then coming to the tips in examination 
uh, most important thing in uh, in managing a duan's uh, retraction syndrome is to assess the abnormal lr innervation so emg is the gold standard but is not available with everyone clinically we can assess the anomalous lr innervation by assessing the retraction of the eye, uh, of the globe and uh, assessing the up and down shoot the more severe the retraction and more severe the up and down shoots tells us that the anomalous uh, lr retraction uh, is more severe Uh, then we have something called as the forced degeneration test of Ramiro Apis. It uh, assesses the abnormal innervation of lateral rectus in adduction. Uh, in this uh, test, we ask the patient to keep the eye in between the um, primary position and adduction, and then the temporal limbus is grasped, uh, grasped uh, with a forcep. And the eye is adducted, and patient is also asked to see in adduction. So. If the anomalous LR activity is there, then um, one experiences a resistance, and then the patient can be asked to look into abduction. And if there is no tuck, then that shows that there is no action of LR in abduction. So, in uh, again, another tip is in Duan's retraction syndrome. In order to accurately measure the angle of deviation, it is important to control the fixating eye during measurements otherwise we get a secondary deviation which is more than the primary then uh, coming to certain tips in managing eso drs in eso drs uh, normally has a minimal lr activity in adduction and they have an anomalous lr action in adduction one has to check for medial rectus contracture by doing fdt as described by jempolski Uh, we do uh, whenever there is a medial rectus contracture, we need to recess the medial rectus, but we recess the mini, me, uh, medial rectus minimally on the side of Duan's retraction, only to loosen up the force junction test. Um, especially if the co-contraction is more, otherwise it will result in abduction deficit and diplopia in the contralateral gaze. If the deviation is more, then we can recess MR recession in both the eyes. Asymmetric MR recessions uh, can be done to uh, take advantage of. Uh, 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 we can uh, do asymmetric if we feel MR recession can be done with uh, SRT, in IRT, uh, or partial VRT to improve the abduction if the co-contraction is not severe. Y split of LR also should uh, can, uh, can be done if there is a significant up and down shoot in adduction. Now this is a, a patient uh, of uh, ESO DRS with head posture, and you can see that there is an abduction deficit with some degree of hypotropia. So in this uh, case, the left eye uh, MR recession of four millimeter was done, and the other eye MR recession of six millimeter was done. And to improve the abduction, an IRT was done to left lateral rectus. So postoperatively, you can see that the head posture is corrected, and there's also some degree of abduction. There's a very short video of uh, superior rectus uh, transposition to LR. Yeah, the superrectus muscle is dissected for about 10 to 12 millimeters behind the insertion, and uh, two vicral sutures are applied. The lateral rectus is hooked, and we apply the muscle along the spiral of Tilo. And the I have taken a five zero with five zero ethy bond. I have taken a posterior fixation suture about eight millimeters behind the insertion. And this uh, taking the suture reduces the chances of post-operative hypertropia. Now, uh, coming to the exodrs, in exodrs, there is an abnormal innervation in both medial rectus and lateral rectus. One has to estimate co-contraction. One has to estimate the LR activity. Exotropia with normal LR activity has to be tackled by doing LR recession. As against uh, ESODRS, where there's a fear of um, uh, exotropia and uh, synergistic divergence, uh, whenever we are doing LR recession, it is never more. So one needs to recess LR liberally. 
exotropy associated with up and down shoots uh, and with retraction. Uh, uh, it is preferable to do a Y split of LR with recession. Uh, we can do supramaximal recession of LR or if the uh, anomalous activity is too severe, even periosteal fixation of a lateral rectus. Uh, always remember there's other eye which can be operated if the, this eye is not sufficient to tackle the deviation. Now, this was one patient of exoDRS who had a significant head posture, exotropia, and a uh, good LR uh, activity in abduction. So, uh, we did a uh, uh, bilateral LR recession, and on the left side, uh, a Y split of was done, which was done 20 millimeters apart. And post operative, you can see that there's a good correction of head posture and improvement in uh, globe retraction and abduction remains good. This is a small video of Y split. The lateral rectus is hooked in LR. The muscles can so be... One minute tight. remaining, ma'am. Yes. And it is uh, difficult sometimes to operate these muscles. In Y split, we are splitting the muscle with the repos I use and repositor. Then... Uh, after marking the center of the glow, uh, center of the insertion, I take one mark 10 millimeters below the center. <coughs> one limb is attached there and the other limb is again attached 10 millimeters um, above from the center. The, uh, the uh, Y split allows us to anchor the globe and thus prevent the slippage of gl uh, globe in adduction because of tight LR. Then uh, the ortho DRS, the uh, ortho DRS, it is better not to disturb, uh, the tip is not to disturb the primary position parallelism. We do operate only if there's a significant retraction on adduction. Differential recession of both LR and MR with preferably one muscle on adjustable. And if there is an up and down shoot, we can do an Y split of LR with MR recession. Here is one patient of an ortho DRS who are in significant uh, globe retraction on adduction. Yeah, I did a uh, differential recession of LR and MR, which uh, corrected her retraction without disturbing her primary position, uh, orthophoria. In bilateral, you treat it as unilateral. And thanks for a patient listening. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. That was a very wonderful talk. Uh, Dr. Uh, Veena, would you like to take some question? Yes, ma'am. Uh, uh, do you pr prefer like you have done uh, any small angle resections? No, I have not done, but uh, uh, there was a paper from Murad uh, et al. Uh, they say that uh, he does a very small uh, resection of lateral rectus. Normally, uh, we say that lateral rectus resections are contraindicated in ESO DRS. But if it has to be done, then we have to do very small resection. That is only 3.5. And uh, the, even the MR recession has to be very small quantity, 4, 4.5 millimeter. Uh, but I have not done uh, resection in a case of DRS. Um, uh, uh, do you modify your Y split depending on the severity of the upshoot or you follow a standard procedure? No, I do a 20 millimeter separation uh, in uh, 20, 22 millimeter separation, how much is possible. I don't modify it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, should, shall we go on to the next talk, uh, Dr. Veena? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. So our next speaker is uh, our Dr. Pandey, and he's going to be talking on managing congenital fibrosis of extraocular muscles, my custom tailored approach. So on to you, doctor. Thank you, Dr. Chitra, for this opportunity to interact with you all. Now, I'll be talking about a rare condition which is uh, difficult to diagnose and treat. And it's a very rare condition seen in 2.3 uh, lakh versus one case. 
So it's quite rare. Now, CFUM is a misnomer. Primarily, it's a neuropathy, not a myopathy, as we all know. Neuropathy affecting all the part of the cranial nerve 3 nucleus and nerve and its innervated muscles and our cochlear nerve and its innervated muscles, that is superior oblique. Now, fibrosis is variable and a secondary event to primary disinnervation. Now, prevalence, as I've said, is very rare, so you may see one or two patients in your lifetime. Now, these are basically CCDDs, as we know, this aberrant signaling of the extraocular muscles by the neurons in the CNS. So, it's a it's problem is with the CNS and the nerves and not at the level of muscles. There are two mechanisms. One is that there has to be correct axonal targeting of the extraocular muscles by these axons, which is regulated by the KIF21A, which is a kinesin. It sort of transports the uh, material proteins to the uh, nerves. And other thing is motor neuron development. Now, these PHOX2A, TUB3 and TUB2B are responsible for this motor neuron development. So, if there's a problem with this, you can also, you can again have this uh, CFUMs. Now, tubulins are important for neurogenesis. Neurogenesis uh, is uh, uh, neural migration and neural differentiation are uh, very essential for CNS development. Microtubules are essential for such processes and microtubules are composed of tubulin proteins. It's like a skeleton and tub 3 and tub 2B fall under these tubulin categories. So if you have a problem with tubulins, you can have CFM and you can also have a lot of other conditions in the CNS and a lot of other things can happen in the CNS in these cases with tub 3 and tub 2, like malformations of the cortical development, the genesis of the corpus callosum, hyperplasia of the oculomotor nerves, absence of the stable peduncles, microcephaly, vocal cord paralysis, and a lot of other things can happen. So one has to look at these aspects also when you're dealing with such a patient. Well, there can be sort of a lot of systemic associations in these cases like facial paralysis, cognitive behavioral development impairment, Kalman syndrome, sensory motor axonal polyneuropathy, bilateral inguinal hernias, and a lot of cryptoorganism, even in plasia, hypoplasia can be there. So we also need to look at them systemically. There could be awkward associations like high refractive errors, astigmatism, amblyopia, optic nerve hypoplasia, typical carlbomas, uh, sensory divergence, convergence, and marker scan phenomena, and even six nerve could be hypoplastic. Now, there are at least eight types of, uh, genetically, there are eight have been defined, like with KIF21A, you have CFM1A, CFM3B, with PHOX2A is CFM2, TUB3 is CFM1B and CFM3A, TUB2B is CFM3A and CFM3 with polymicrogyria, Tuchel syndrome, the gene has not been identified as yet. It has been described in the Turkish family. Now, uh, this uh, CUFM2 and Tuchel syndrome are recessive. Rest are all autosomal dominant with uh, good penitence. Now, phenotypes show a lot of variability. There's restriction of upgaze that is sine conon. In almost all the cases, we'll have restriction of the upgaze. And there's chin up and tosis because of restriction and tosis is almost never be there with these cases. There is usually an exotropia, but these eyes could also be isotropic and there could be variable limitation of horizontal gaze. There's poor, uh, poor bells and exposure keratitis and poor and absent binocularity in these cases. Most of these cases have very poor binocularity. This is showing a family. You can see three generations, autosomal dominant CFM1, the grandfather, the mother and two daughters and all having a very typical mirror image presentation. Now this is showing the younger girl. You can see there's a, a pattern. As I go up, there is some convergence and I just don't go beyond primary position. They don't even reach the primary position. And the left, this is like a gaze palsy. The left side eyes are not moving as compared to the right side. So horizontal alignment can be very variable in these cases. And she has stigmatism about 4.5 uh, cylinder with a plus sphere. This is showing fundus is showing extortion in this case, and other eye seems to be left eye. Uh, uh, left eye is extorted, right eye seems to be normal. And uh, this is the other girl. She has far more astigmatism, about minus seven. And she has also typical presentation like the other girl. Only thing is that the horizontal movements are different in both the children, and both have exotropia. Now, this one is showing in torsion as compared to the previous one, the other sister. Now, we don't know why some go into extortion and why some go into extortion. Maybe if the IR is tight, that should cause extortion. But here, we also have in torsion in this child. This is the mother. 
which had uh, also exotropia with gross limitation. This is another sporadic child boy who had cataract in the left eye and he has ESO as compared to the, that family which had an exo deviation. As you see CFM2, you can see eyes are almost fixed to the lateral canthi because the third and fourth, both nerves are affected in CFM2. This is autosomal recessive and described mostly in Saudi Arabia. And uh, this is CFM3, which can be very variable. It can be unilateral, like in this one, you have left uh, CFM, there's high myopia and there's typical coloboma. Right eye is showing a congenital anophthalmos with cystic eyeball. And there's also cryptocodism and renal agenesis in this patient. So it was a very interesting, complex patient. We could not do genetic analysis, so we don't know most of it. Now, some of these NVDs with IR fibrosis could also be unilateral CFUM because the IR is uh, fibrosed. Now, this may be associated with MGP, facial palsy, and cortical malformations. There's hypoplastic oculomotor nerve. There could be variable fibrosis of the IR. And CFUM3 with TUB3 has been identified in one of the reports with CFUM3. Uh, with the uh, top three variant in MED. Now, workup would include uh, his history, family history, systemic exa examination, motility evaluation, and HP, post duction test, visual equity, and LIP, and refractive errors. As we said, they are quite often they have high errors and high astigmatism. The LPS function, Bell's phenomena, and corneal exposure are important to look at because quite often they have uh, corneal exposure. MRI, brain, and obvious needs to be done to document. Uh, 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 ocular motor four six nerves and abnormalities of the extraocular muscle thickness or insertions because they could also have abnormal insertions. Photographic documentation and linkage analysis. Now, differential diagnosis would, would include CPE or bilateral congenital thermopathy, which will be very rare. Bilateral browns may be rarely Mobius and maybe congenital MED. As we said, that this could be. Uh, if it is unilateral, it may be quite like that. Uh, one minute remaining. Could be non surgical correction of refractory as we said, with glasses or contact lenses. They have quite often very high astigmatism. Amyloipia treatment should be done, and ocular surface uh, lubrication is important and need, one has to take care of. Now, the surgical treatment is to improve AHP, to align the eyes in primary position, and improve motility. Not all need surgery, so it's not that just because it's uh, a CFM, they have to be put to the knife. Now, the challenges are in this case, surgery is difficult due to extreme fibrosis of the extraocular muscles. Abnormal insertions could be there. Recessions need to be very large as, as, as far as you can than conventional decisions. There could be often orbital bands and safety. The poor best tosis surgery need to be undercorrected and may lead to exposure keratitis. Results are modest. Multiple surgical procedures may be required in these cases. Now, to conclude, it's rare, one in 2.3 lakh population, prone for misdiagnosis. Congenital uh, restrictive ophthalmoplegia with of vertical gaze could be unilateral, bilateral, with or without ptosis, and the surgical outcomes are modest. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Pandey, for a very extensive talk and a lot of clarity given on this uh, uh, entity. Uh, I have a question uh, for the expert panel on this. Um, what is the take on anterior segment ischemia following strabismus surgery in this condition? Um, Dr. Rohit? Uh, Ma'am, in this condition, huh. uh, so, uh, I mean, to the best of our knowledge, there is no change in the vascularity per se. Although uh, the myofibrils are not developed and uh, there is fibrotic tissue resulting in the large angle strabismus, but that does not alter the vascular supply. So uh, more often than uh, frequently, we uh, operate the vert two vertical recti often in the first go or as a subsequent surgery, and no change is observed. Uh, uh, occasionally, we've gone on to do a, a third muscle to correct for a residual horizontal angle, but again, in a young patient, uh, have not observed any significant vascular uh, problems in such cases. No, actually, uh, IR is always affected in these cases, and IRs are quite, uh, I mean, they're quite important for anti segment circulation. So that's one point. No, and most of these but, but the IR vascular surgery. supply remains fairly. That's okay. not an issue. That's no, not vascular issue. supply is not an issue. Yeah, yeah. Very difficult to operate, especially as Harris is talking about the IR, because uh, it's not uncommon that we've had, you know, the the, ten, uh, the tendon actually just splitting the 
you know, pulled into two syndrome for, you know, when you're trying to release or assess the inferior rectus because it's so tight, the process of hooking or attempting to pass sutures itself sometimes, uh, you know, once or twice we've had it broken. But uh, that's like... There's no uh, deficient ciliary circulation in this uh, 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 thing? No, uh? Not reported no. as such. Not, not reported as a deficient uh, anterior circulatory system uh, uh, there. I mean, otherwise you would have seen a lot of a plethora of anterior segment issues also, which would, you know, stem cell deficiency, limbal stem cell deficiency, anterior segment related issues, which are not, you know, often they are just an isolated uh, anomaly, uh, at least in the anterior segment. You would have a lot of other features you may have, but uh, at least you don't see significant anterior segment related issues. Uh, Dr. Have you tried expanders in these cases? <laughs> No, I haven't tried as uh, I haven't tried expanders. Like I said, sometimes it's very, very difficult to just be able to, you know, pass sutures and disinsert the muscle. Uh, so uh, more often than not, you use uh, a non-absorbable and you may have to kind of leave it on a large hangback so that you can do large recessions if you're able to manage. I mean, you, as Sir has pointed out, you need to do large recessions uh, in these conditions to release the uh, FTT. Actually, these are very tight muscles. Unfortunately, I could not show a video of this surgery was done some time back, you know. They're very difficult and very tight muscles. And uh, even if they are pulled into two, it doesn't probably, it may be, uh, the results will be almost the same. So they're very difficult okay. situations that way. And results are very modest. So one has to explain to them that it's not going to be a very perfect situation for them. So, uh, uh, Dr. Thanks. Chitra, I just want to add one thing. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, un uh, unhealthy nerves lead to unhealthy muscles and unhealthy muscles will not have very good uh, supply, uh, vascular supply. And therefore, the contribution to the anterior segment wouldn't be so much. And therefore, the result of its stenotomy is also is unlikely to be uh, very, uh, you know, uh, impressive or uh, hurting. And because of the rarity of the condition, uh, the, I mean, barring perhaps people in RP center, uh, individual cases, people like sitting like us wouldn't have too much experience to really, uh, you know, talk very authentically on that. Yeah, you see, one in once in ten years, I think maybe yeah. after center they might be seeing more, but well, so very I, rare. So I, um, I just had a case I've done. I've done large recessions only. You see, one which was not easy to get, and still I've not got a very effective correction yeah. because no matter how much you recess, they always remain undercorrected. Yes, that's the that's the message. So you can do as much decision you want. Even feet and not me, <laughs> that may also be fine in these cases. Uh, thank you very much. We shall now go on to our, our next speaker, Dr. Amrita Sindhu. She is a, a medical consultant, pediatric ophthalmology and adult strabismus from Arvind Eye Care System at Coimbatore. And she is going to be talking on transposition procedures in strabismus. On to you, doctor. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, I hope my slides are visible. Yes, yes. Okay, at this outset, I would like to thank uh, AIOS for this uh, beautiful opportunity. So in next few minutes, I would like to uh, uh, talk about transposition procedures. So the aim of uh, the, where do we do uh, this transposition procedures? Basically in paralytic strabismus, monocular elevation deficits, Duane retraction syndrome, any lost, absent or slipped muscle. So one uh, important point in this transposition procedure is that we should always do a force duction test and it should be free. So if not, we have to always resist the antagonist. So the aim of the uh, uh, the aim of this transposition procedure is to align the eyes in primary position, to improve the paratic gaze, and also to improve the uh, dipropia free visual field for the patient. So basically, I would like to classify these transposition procedures based on the nerve palsy which is involved. So the most commonly uh, done. Uh, uh, procedures is for the sixth nerve palsy. So uh, sixth nerve palsy, the, way, the commonly done procedures are full tendon uh, vertical rectus transpositions, Hummelsheim procedure, uh, Jensen was previously done, but uh, not much in practice these days, and uh, uh, the Nishida's technique. 
So the VRT can be broadly classified into, it can be a double muscle VRT or a single muscle VRT. So double muscle uh, is uh, either a full tendon VRT or a partial tendon VRT. Single muscle is preferred uh, if you have to correct a small degree of hypo or hypertropia and for smaller deviations. So both this double muscle or a single muscle VRTs can be uh, added with MR recession if there is a MR uh, tightness or uh, it can be added on with the augmentation sutures to increase the uh, amount of uh, uh, the correction is required. And also some uh, surgeons prefer to use uh, Botox in the antagonistic muscle in order to reduce the tightness of the antagonist. Uh, either this Botox, Botox is given along with the uh, transposition or uh, following the procedure also injection is given. So coming to the vertical rectus transposition as such, uh, the uh, full tendon uh, vertical transposition, uh, although we can do it, but uh, usually most of these uh, uh, palsies are associated with the uh, tightness of MR. So including the MR along with two full tendon VRT is, uh, uh, there is a high risk of uh, uh, getting an ASI. So usually the party, partial tendon VRT is what is preferred because it spares the ciliary vessels and hence can be combined with MR recession. So uh, we can do a single muscle VRT, as I already told, it can be an SRT or an IRT, which if we added with augmentation and combined with uh, recession gives similar results. So VRTs uh, can uh, usually correct up to 25 to 30 prisms of esotropia and when added with the uh, MR recession can correct up to 50 to 60 prisms of esotropias. Uh, the one of the most common procedure done for uh, six nerve palsy is the Hummelsheim procedure. Though all, although the original Hummelsheim has got a lot of modifications over time, uh, uh, this uh, Hummelsheim is uh, nothing but a partial tendon uh, VRT. So usually this uh, uh, the partial tendon of superior and inferior rectus is transposed towards the paralyzed LR. So uh, this can be uh, this augmented Hummelsheim is nothing but uh, the the partial tendon which has to be transposed is resected and it is split and then uh, the split lateral rectal ends and fixed at the lateral rectus. So this can also be combined with augmentation uh, uh, and also this uh, the advantage of Hummelsheim is that it can correct large angle of esotrophias up to forty uh, prism diopters and also the one more advantage is that it improves the abduction. So a small note on augmentation sutures as such, uh, the augmentation improves uh, the abducting force by creating an additional force at the point of sutures. It is uh, seen that uh, uh, using this augmentation sutures can improve the abduction of about uh, more than 50%. The commonly used uh, augmentation suture are uh, foster sutures. Foster suture is nothing but the vertical muscle bellies are fixated to the sclera about eight mm uh, from the LR insertion that is almost uh, near the equator. So the other uh, less commonly used is the right suture, which is nothing but the intermuscular augmentation of 8 mm uh, posterior to the insertion, although this is not very commonly done because there can be a splaying of muscles over time and uh, the, the sutures may not uh, be fixed at a uh, desired point. So the complications of VRT uh, is uh, it can cause adduction limitation, although patients may not complain about it. Uh, it is about seen about 13 to 43%. Vertical deviations and torsional diplopia are quite common. So conventional VRT can cause uh, small angles of vertical deviation. It is seen uh, zero to 40% and uh, augmentation can cause it uh, zero to 30%. And uh, as we all know, it can cause, especially full tendon can cause, uh, there is a more risk of anterior segment ischemia. Coming to the modified Nishida stiffness, which is the most favorite of uh, many of the surgeons because it is a no split, no tenotomy transposition procedures. Here, one third of the vertical uh, muscle bellies are sutured into the sclera in superior and inferior temporal quadrants, about uh, uh, eight to 10 millimeter uh, posterior to the insertion. So Nishida is almost uh, used in all kinds of surgery, not only in the sixth nerve palsy, also in monocular elevation deficits, transected uh, medial rectus, inferior rectus, aplasia. So the, uh, the advantage of uh, Nishida, modified Nishida is it corrects a large angle of deviation as uh, there is no uh, splitting or no tenotomy involved. There is almost no risk of anterior segment ischemia in these uh, cases. You have one minute remaining, ma'am. Uh, it has good results with the uh, resurgeries and uh, uh, complex surgeries. 
So a short video. I would like to thank my mentor, uh, Dr. Sandra Ma'am, for this beautiful video of modified nishidas. Here, uh, uh, initially, uh, uh, medial rectus has been recessed because FTT was positive. So MR has been recessed uh, by about 6 mm. Then uh, through a forex-based incision, superior uh, rectus muscle about 9 mm posterior. There is a suture taken in one third of uh, muscle belly. Uh, and uh, it is fixated to the uh, sclera in the superior temporal quadrant using a non-absorbable suture. Similarly to the phonic space incision in the infrotemporal uh, quadrant, uh, I, uh, IR is uh, sutured at uh, one third tendon is taken and it is fixated in the infrotemporal quadrant. So this uh, uh, gives a very excellent result, especially uh, gives a very good result in the primary gaze and can correct large angle of uh, deviation. In short, about the third nerve palsy, although it is very difficult to correct uh, third nerve uh, palsy, uh, recently many of uh, the surgeons started doing medial transposition of split lateral rectus, either pre-equatorially or just behind the insertion of a medial rectus, which is uh, uh, known to give good results. Uh, in short, about monocular elevation defi deficits, we all know there are various causes for MED. It can be paralysis of elevators, inferior rectus restrictions, or it can be a supranuclear pathologies. So surgical planning basically depends on the etiology, so which is most commonly diagnosed on table uh, after force duction test. So NAPS procedure is the commonly done procedure for uh, MEDs. So the results of NAPS are variable. There are again various modifications of NAPS. Uh, the conventional NAPS can correct up to 30 to 35 prisms. Augmented NAPS can correct up to uh, 40 prisms. Uh, sometimes we also do a partial tendon NAPS to correct the horizontal deviations associated with MAD. So last but not the least, the loop myopixy, which is uh, uh, used for high myopic strabismus uh, fixes, which is nothing but union of SR and LR bellies in the superior temporal quadrant, 15 millimeter posterior to the limbus with or without uh, scleral fixation. A short video of uh, loop myopixy. Again, I would like to thank my uh, mentor, Dr. Sandra, for this beautiful video. It's a large uh, esotropia. Uh, due to high myopia, left eye was actually uh, strab uh, strabismic amblyopia. The surgery is done. Uh, here, uh, MR was found to be tight. It is uh, recessed. I would like to just fast forward it for the want of time. Again, uh, here uh, we can see the LR is shifted down. It is hooked, it is uh, split and about 9 uh, to 10 mm posteriorly uh, sutures are taken. And uh, both the muscle bellies are, I'm sorry about that, yeah. Both the, using a non-absorbable suture, the muscle bellies are joined together so that the herniated part of the globe is pushed back and uh, the normal anatomy of the mus uh, muscles are retained. So this is in short about uh, the transposition uh, procedures. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Again, uh, 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 amazing talk. And I have just one question before uh, uh, Veena can take on. How would you manage uh, sixth nerve uh, palsy uh, with very large esotropia and nil lateral rectus uh, function? Um, anybody on the expert panel or... Would like to answer? Yes, ma'am. Any uh, uh, we have to do the FTT first. See for MR contracture. Uh, so most of the time, uh, it uh, it has a very uh, tight uh, MR because long-standing esotropias, long long-standing uh, LR palsy can have a contracted MR. So we should always combine with the MR recession. MR recession. So either we can go for a Hummel sheen or a, a modified uh, Nishida's technique to correct large angle uh, six nerve palsies, esotropias. Dr. Rohit, would you want to add anything? Uh, no, I think he's covered it very well. We had published a meta-analysis of the various transposition procedures in IGO, where we found that uh, SRT with an augmentation suture with an MR recession is actually very, very effective. It's uh, as effective as a partial VRT with augmentation with an MR recession. So uh, I 
I personally prefer an SRT with posterior fixation with an MR adjustable MR recession, and I would say it would cover almost very very large up to very large angles of uh, uh, esotropia. So you could have a MR large MR recession adjustable with a superior rectus transposition with a posterior poster suture. I prefer. I don't prefer a right suture because as uh, Dr. Sindhu mentioned, there is long-term play of the muscle and the effectivity of the transposition gets reduced. And would you also combine it with a Botox injection to the medial rectus? So I do not uh, combine it in the first go with uh, Botox. Like I said, usually a large MR recession with SRT with uh, posterior fixation is very, very effective. But if there is a residual uh, early on, uh, you could think of a, a large residual early on, you could add a Botox so that as the transposition process, transpositions we have realized get better with time as the tissue adapts. So if you have a small undercorrection, it will get corrected over time. In fact, I dread a perfect correction because I know it may get an overcorrection over time. So small undercorrection, leave it. A large undercorrection, Botox in the medial rectus. Uh, Veena, would you want to take or shall we go on to the next uh, speaker? Yes, I will. Uh... So then we shall go on to our uh, next speaker, Dr. Meenakshi, who's going to be talking on managing paralytic strabismus, which I believe is one of the most challenging areas for a strabismologist. I don't know whether I need to be uh, corrected on that. So let's hear from her. Uh, good evening. I thank the organizing committee for giving this uh, opportunity. Uh, my talk is on management of paralytics for business and doing it in seven minutes is going to be a tough task, but uh, Amrita has made it really easy. Uh, it's an incompetent strabismus, which can be partial or total. And in incompetent, it can be all these types, restrictive, paralytic, neurogenic, myogenic, or spastic type. And it can be at the various levels, supranuclear, nuclear, internuclear, or intranuclear. I hope the slides are visible. And I'm yes. Yeah. yes, yes. Uh, so coming to the management, to start from the history taking, and these are the, some of the red flags when you are seeing a uh, nerve palsy, and then there is an associated vision loss, headache, trauma, fever, proptosis, or any vestibular symptoms, and any absence of systemic disease. And the evaluation, I'm not going into the detail, except that you should remember to do a refraction and a fundus for caution, and diplopia and mischart is a must. And FBT and uh, FGT is also a very uh, important part of the uh, testing process. And uh, you should not forget the evaluation of the sensory status, whether uh, because that changes our whole plan, whether there is any diplopia or whether there is any stereopsis or all that have to be checked. And not last but the least is a comprehensive uh, neurological examination. And uh, some of the photos where you Patients usually have an abnormal head posture just to make sure that they don't have a uh, diplopia free field, venture a diplopia free field, but some can uh, adopt a other head posture also so that the distance between the image is increased so that we can ignore the image. Uh, an important, another important thing is we should check the ocular motility examination, check for saccades and pursuits, the doll's eye movement, ductions, always ductions are better than the uh, Version, so we may miss the uh, nerve palsy and then vergences, especially in INO. Uh, uh, FDT, a small point is it is restricted uh, in a case of mechanical restriction, whereas it is free in a muscle palsy. And same way in FGT, it is the other way around. FGT, uh, mechanical restriction, it is uh, post generation is normal, whereas in muscle palsy, it is absent. Uh, so another important thing is torsion. We have to see in the either indirect or direct. This I have shown a direct ophthalmoscopy photo where it is usually normally seven degrees below the uh, optic disc, and uh, it is uh, when the eye is extracted, it is below this plane. And in torsion, it is upward. It is in a direct ophthalmoscopy picture. It is exact opposite in the indirect. Uh, a comprehensive ocular examination for checking the pupil and a comprehensive neurological examination. Coming to the investigations, always streamline your test. Uh, all the blood counts, sugar, BP, 
uh, all that have to be done. And uh, a mandatory indication for neuroimaging is multiple cranial nerve palsy, or uh, if there is a systemic palsy, somebody's life has to be moved. Could you please uh, mute everybody? Uh, intracranial mass when you are suspecting, or any associated field defects, or uh, any signs of uh, cerebellar or other this thing have to be uh, imaged. And in the pediatric age group, it is always better to image uh, rather than uh, leaving it, uh, uh, taking it for granted. Always image in, whenever you are having a pediatric love pass. Medical management is very important uh, in general control all the uh, systemic conditions. And uh, uh, optical therapy, it's, uh, uh, we can use a patching to prevent uh, alternate eye patching to prevent amblyopia and to prevent the diplopia or ground glass can be given. And smaller deviation, and if the deviation is stable, prisms can be given. Either frenal or uh, preformed prisms can be given. So coming to the uh, important uh, topic of uh, indications for surgical therapy, which I will be concentrating on. Uh, the main thing is you have to have uh, stable deviation, at least two consecutive charts showing no change. And at least you should have been there at least for six months. And systemic factors have to be controlled. The primary goal is a primary position uh, uh, alignment and elevation of the abnormal head posture and the elimination of diplopia and uh, not last but the least is the enlarging binocular stimulation field. So coming to the turn of uh, palsy, uh, Amrita has made my job easier. Uh, check for the residual medial rectus function. If it is crossing the midline and if it is uh, present, then we can go for a uh, maximum recession and resection procedure itself. And no, but if it is not there, there is no point in clogging a, a dead horse. If there is no medial rectus action, uh, then you can go for a lateral uh, periosteal orbital fixation or uh, globe anchoring to the medial orbital wall. Here we are showing a, a photo where we have done a congenital thermal palsy, where we have done a supra uh, maximal lateral rectus recession 14 millimeters along with the uh, medial rectus uh, resection and uh, the eye is almost straight. So we can even with a simple procedure we can get away with it and uh, uh, this is a pre-op and a post-op uh, picture where we have uh, uh, recessed the, uh, sorry, where we have disinserted the uh, lateral rectus using a non-absorbable suture and then fixing it to the lateral orbital wall 5 millimeters posterior to the, uh, to the uh, periosteum. One thing we have to remember is you should close the uh, uh, muscular septum well, otherwise it will get reattached. So that is one important point. Um, this uh, split lateral rectus muscle for uh, uh, oculometer palsy, a lot of variations are there. Uh, even Dr. Rohit Sakana in the recent article where he has done a cross fixation of this. Um, here, this is a pre-op photo. It is a, a traumatic uh, thermopalsy and uh, uh, you can see the pre-op and then the uh, post-op picture where the eye is straight. Where, uh, I'm showing a sharing the video where uh, we have uh, first done the uh, uh, posterior uh, uh, PTSO also. So when you do a PTSO, it helps in uh, uh, two things. It will help in when you are passing the suture also, it will be easier and uh, you will uh, have a better uh, effect also. So use a gauze, uh, uh, what is the media? Uh, and you have one minute remaining. And then uh, you can do uh, this thing. Here, uh, this is uh, PTSO being done. And uh, you partially uh, take the, split the lateral rectus into two halves. And then the most difficult part is passing it under the uh, recti muscle and the obliques. So use the uh, prefix features and then take it underneath the uh, inferior rectus and the inferior oblique and then attach it uh, along the uh, superior and inferior to the medial rectus muscle. Uh, one difficulty is, uh, we can have is when you are using the uh, doing the superior oblique that is why you use a PTSO it makes our job much easier. So usually we perform on the affected eye first and rather than the fellow eye, fellow eye we can think of when you are having an aberrant regeneration so that it has an effect of uh, fixation during its uh, suture. Coming to the fourth nerve palsy, the commonest cause of uh, acquired vertical strabismus. So one thing we have to remember is it can be congenital. So whenever there is a large vertical fusion amplitude, 
and you should get the family album uh, tomography because suddenly patient will say at uh, the age of 30 that he's having diplopia, but it can still be a long standing. So based on the old photograph, we can find it. And in an acquired, usually they have a characteristic hip tilt to the opposite shoulder and uh, yeah, pass three test three steps test to help in uh, identifying it. And always think bilateral when you have a positive adjustments when it is onto the both sides or a chin down or a V pattern and then mesotropia is there or we have a 10 degree more than 10 degree of extortion. This is there in all the is there in all the books. One thing I just want to mention is always check the superior oblique. Uh, how is the superior oblique? Whether it is very lax or not, especially in congenital this thing. No point in just directly weakening the inferior oblique alone because if you don't do uh, this thing, tuck, uh, it will not help in making the eye straight. And uh, a bilateral, you check for the torsion less than 10 degree or more than 10 degree. More than 10 degree, go for a harada ito. I'm not talking on the grading of the inferior oblique because uh, another person is already tapping on it. And uh, this is a video showing a superior oblique tuck. Always do a, a, a guidance uh, exaggerated force tuction test and uh, uh, go along the temporal border of the superior rectus. One tip in the tuck is uh, uh, when you are, uh, you should remember that we have to take only half of the whatever measurement we want when we are taking the uh, uh, measurement of the caliper so that we don't land up with an overcorrection. So this is what uh, you have to measure, half of it, and then, and then tuck it. And, uh, so this is the suture uh, being uh, taken. And uh, after attaching it back to the sclera there close by, one thing we have to do is do a FTT again. You can do an adjustable in this also. Uh, and uh, finally, you check the uh, uh, force duction test has to be done or a passive duction testing can be, traction testing can be done and make sure that you don't do a, a cause an hydrogenic uh, uh, oblique palsy. So in a passive uh, traction testing, you are uh, when you pull the globe up, it should at least uh, it should be at the level of the uh, uh, medial campus. So with that, we will know whether it is uh, uh, the same want of time I'm skipping this Saradaito video. So coming to the last one, uh, sixth of palsy, uh, you can have uh, even following acute ET, following uh, polio drops or viral fever, all that we have to remember. Or it can be a keratocavernous uh, fistula. Uh, so that is why imaging is very important or it can be following a uh, raised ICT. And this is one case report where uh, you can have a combined mechanism. This is a three years of, this is a pre-op photo or two years of orthophoria. At three years, uh, uh, the patient had presented with uh, uh, mesotropia of six months duration and they, it was partially corrected. And then when we neuroimaged, it turned out to be a medulloblastoma and the child is orthophoric now with just simple hyperopic correction alone. So this plays the importance of uh, doing a neuroimaging. And uh, Botox tox, uh, botulinum toxin plays a very important role in the treatment of sixth nerve palsy. It's, uh, here we have shown a pre-op and a post-op photo where it's just uh, uh, injection into the medial rectus gives the uh, good correction. Transposition has been well taken by uh, Dr. Amrita. Uh, usually we do a, a augmented, uh, we have done, an, this is a video showing an augmented uh, amal sheet. I'm just showing the one side alone in the superior rectus, where uh, the main thing is, as you said, the FDT has to be done, so it won't work if your FDT is positive. So split the uh, superior rectus well, and uh, four millimeters, we have taken mark and uh, done a resection, and the uh, suture is uh, taken at uh, four millimeters. And the main thing is, you have to disinsert at least 12 millimeters or to 14 millimeters, so that we can split the tendon and uh, split the muscle and bring it and place it along the spiral of tear. So this is the video where we have uh, placed it. I'm just showing only the superior rectus. So, or we can just do a single muscle transposition as Rohit uh, told, uh, that also gives very uh, good result or uh, cross action, like uh, instead of just placing at the level of uh, uh, the uh, medial rectus, uh, lateral rectus, we can 
go and cross fixate it also. Nishida, I am not talking. This is a, one of our case where it, we can see the pre and the post op where it is giving good results. At one or two cases, we got an overcorrection also. One case we had an overcorrection. The one most important advantage is we just had to release the suture and everything was back to normal. So I'm not showing the video. So it still remains a challenge because we are not able to give a diplopia free field in all the cases. And one important thing is we have to identify the etiology as some can be life threatening and then subsequently treat with suitable modalities. So it can range from observation to surgical intervention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Minakshi. That was a, a amazing talk. And uh, Dr. Veena, would you want to take a question? We yes, have a number of speakers. So yeah, I have only one question. Dr. Yeah. Minakshi, when the patient has diplopia only in extreme cases, do you prefer uh, sectoral patches? Uh, only in uh, extreme cases, I would uh, prefer not to do a surgery and you can go for uh, prisms or uh, patching. OK. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Minakshi. We shall now go on to our next speaker, Dr. Sumita Agarkar, who is going to be talking on pediatric cataract surgeries, the essentials. Uh, could you unmute yourself, Dr. Sumita? Am I, am I audible now? Yes, yes. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Chitra, for giving me this extra 10 seconds and also for inviting me in this uh, seminar, webinar. Uh, so I'm going to try to summarize the pediatric cataract surgery in seven minutes. So without move. So how is it different in children? Yes, like etiology, most of it is likely to be intrauterine infection, especially in our country and also likely to be associated with other ocular and system comorbidities, unlike in adults. Of course, needless to say, anatomically, it's a more challenging because smaller eyes, tighter uh, anterior chamber uh, depths, shorter uh, axial lengths, Every, each of it brings its own challenge in the anatomical sense. So the questions here are whether uh, are these, basically, when, I, when you look at a child with cataract, so if you look at one by one, how early is early? Well, early surgery increases the risk of glaucoma post-surgery, but this has to be weighed against the risk of deprivational amblyopia. So Birch et al. and Lambert et al. both have recommended surgery by six to eight weeks of age. However, this may have to be modified by a child's fitness for anesthesia and systemic conditions, especially in infants. In toddlers, presence of nystagmus or strabismus indicates that cataract is visually significant and needs to be operated. In older children, the decision is based on vision but size and location of a cataract also may play a role. A posterior located cataract probably is more visually significant than a nuclear cataract. And also to remember that every cataract does not need surgery. And just because we see a cataract, surgery is not to be recommended in every case because along with cataract or lens, you are also taking away child's accommodation, which is not acceptable, even if however beautifully done IOL you may have placed. So these are examples where probably surgery is neither recommended nor, in, nor justified uh, ethically. So coming to the pre-op evaluation, uh, comprehensive eye evaluation trumps everything else. Imaging like US ultrasound, UBM, ASOCT, wherever applicable, are valuable in better planning. Surgery should be used as an opportunity. Surgery itself can be used as an opportunity to do a good evaluation under anesthesia. And some of the tests like corneal diameter, axial length, intraocular pressure, baseline keratometry, baseline gonioscopy can all be documented just using five minutes before surgery when, before the child is draped. And of course, if you are planning an IOL in a very small young child, uh, biometry has to be done under uh, anesthesia. But otherwise, in older children, cooperative children, it can be done uh, otherwise. So coming to the surgery, we are lucky that there is no nucleus and we are all basically aspirationists. So most of the surgery can be done through side ports. Uh, making a side port using uh, MVR blade rather than a side entry knife is better in children because it keeps chamber much better formed. 
uh, capsule in children is elastic and occasional surprises in terms of fibrous capsule you should be ready for. Occasionally, again, most of the lens is very easily uh, possible to do a FECO aspiration or a bimanual aspiration. But occasionally, even in infants, even in very, very young children, you can have a dense calcified nucleus, which requires some amount of uh, technical manipulations in your surgical technique. Uh, needless to say, a cohesive OVD and uh, dyes have made our lives very easy in past uh, 15, 20 years. And I cannot imagine doing surgery without uh, either of these in, in infants. Some of the surprises, nasty surprises, which can be occur on table is a posterior uh, persistent fetal vasculature and posterior capsular dehiscence. This may complicate your post-operative uh, post-operative outcomes. So uh, just uh, going step by step on surgery, you can, as I said, capsulotomy is the co anterior capsulotomy is the key technique here. And you can use both instrumentation, like you can use in a small eye, if you feel that you're not going to, like in this case, 9.5 millimeter, if you're not going to use uh, 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 IOL or anything, you can just use your, uh, your Retractor itself to aspirate and uh, create a capsulotomy and very easy to, it need not come out at all. While in the other video, as you could see, there is uh, a role for uh, forceps or a, to do the capsulotomy, which is far more controlled. Now, sometimes you can have, I don't think this video is playing. Let's so sometimes you can have a really fibrous capsule and here sometimes you may have to change your technique in terms of uh, using uh, uh, scissors to create an opening. And uh, good thing to remember here is the capsule which is not elastic enough to be pulled using uh, a forceps will not even extend also. So there is a little bit of um, comfort in that. This capsulotomy is unlikely to extend even despite having a slightly irregular edges compared to a manual capsulotomy, as you can see here. Uh, as said earlier, sometimes you can get a, a, a nucleus, which is, this is a one and a half month old child. And as you can see, there is this solid nucleus. I'm not planning to put an IOR, but finally I had to use some something like a chopper using through my other side entry to finally aspirate it without, and it took me 40 minutes to get this uh, FACO aspiration done <laughs> using. And I did not want to extend the incision, but I was frustrated enough to even consider to actually bring it out through, the, through another incision. Um, now coming to the posterior capsulotomy, again, here the key lies in having a uh, retroillumination where you can see your posterior capsule nicely against a red glow. If your microscope affords for a, a good retroillumination, this step you should switch to uh, retroillumination rather than anything. And as you can see, uh, the, the force of tearing should always be towards the center. And ideally a good posterior capsule osteotomy should be a millimeter smaller than your anterior capsulotomy. And that gives you a good, uh, good base and good visual. Uh, it prevents visual axis of in even in very younger children. So sometimes you can have a very, very intumescent cataract. And it is a little bit uh, here again, the key step is in anterior capsular axis and you may have to actually decompress the lens a bit before doing capsulotomy. Now coming to the correction of a fakia, which you have done following the surgery. Glasses are a very, very viable option in bilateral cataracts and they do very well. Only thing, important thing is to have a good fitting frame with a big, uh, as you can see here, uh, a clip which allows them to have nasal support. You remember that children do not have nose bone to support your lenses. And something like this should be, uh, should be helpful to keep the fitting better. And a lot of times children reject glasses because not because they don't want to wear glasses or but because 
the fit is poor um good fitting frames are often expensive and probably but it's an investment worth uh, its uh, weight in gold if children can in unilateral cases probably contact lenses both soft lenses and rgp we have tried both rgp works better because it provides a better oxygenation and better uh, better uh, cover or uh, better uh, long term uh, corneal effects are better with rgp and you have but, one minute remaining but lenses are difficult to fit and have to be customized and you have to have to have a good contact with a good con uh, contact lens uh, lab to allow you to have the fitting and last but not least the iol which is now a standard of care for anybody above one and i don't think there is anything uh, questionable about putting an intraocular lens in a child who is one year and above however in infants and young children it is still complicated both iats study and tap study suggest that there was no particular visual benefit in contact lenses versus iols in infants however there was an increase in uh, incidence of visual access specification as well as rates of free surgery and this probably uh, but i have both the studies suffered from a slightly flaw in the sense that they were both uh, the iat study basically looked at uh, intraocular uh, lenses in children who were who had unilateral cataract and i my personal uh, take on the study was that probably they did not use enough steroids which was required and probably the capsular a vitrectomy which they performed using a pass planar route probably was not sufficient that's why there was so much of uh, bio incidents in their uh, their series um, i'm sure there are several authors and several people in this panel who will beg to disagree with the iats uh, con con conclusions and probably again there can be a little bit of cultural differences in when you decide to choose an iol for infants <clears throat> so in 2021 this is my personal take on iul in infants that it is an anatomical decision not really dependent on age or laterality if the eye is of sufficient size axial length is fairly good corneal diameter of at least 10.5 mm or more no ocular comorbidities and a good pupillary dilation i would probably implant an iul i would also consider socio economic factors like ability of parents for follow up and replacement of contact lenses to uh, to help me in deciding and of course sometimes availability of other services like having a good glaucoma specialist or an instrumentation to check pressures in these children also involves is is, is something i factor in when i'm taking decision to put or not put iul um this is the last slide but most important we have to talk to the parents and we must also convince ourselves first that surgery is only the first and the easiest step on a very very long road these children need lifelong follow up in terms of glaucoma visual access opacification retinal detachment and amblyopia they need in every visit refraction intraocular pressure disc evaluation and a dilated fundus evaluation sometimes if you have access to a wide wide angle imaging it is probably a very useful tool in younger children during follow up this is my personal um, opinion on wide angle imaging but yes nothing nothing replaces a good comprehensive eye evaluation which any trained ophthalmologist can do thank you for your attention that was a very uh, detailed talk and uh, truly uh, very informative and uh, i i you answered most of the questions i had for you but i would just thought i'll ask you what would be the iol formula today present day with the four generation formulas all opened up which would be the formula you would use for infants infants and uh, children yeah so uh, i remember when we started putting iols in uh, age 2 and above uh, maybe 15 years back at that time also there was a lot of talk about this and whether you should put iol not put iol iol calculations are uh, doubtful and i'm i'm sorry to note that last year 2021 in fact uh the dr saulin kaur and had written an editorial in igo i think it was published last month 
where the same same argument was repeated ki in children there isn't a good iul formula so i think truth has remained that there isn't a single good iul calculation formula which works for younger children i have no objection for using srkt barrett's for anybody who is above 4 or 5 it works perfectly well even srkt works well let's not uh, fool ourselves into thinking only barrett's and all nothing doing uh, but problem with infants and children who are under 2 still remains question you still get dbr surprises of both types over and under uh, i think most of it is not problems with the formula but the problems with how we take the recordings yeah in young children yeah it's, if you are especially if you are doing lot of these dbrs are under ga there are issues with centration and small error in a smaller i can magnify to a to a really great extent uh, what am i using i use a combination of both srk2 and barrett's and sometimes usually take a mean of both <laughs> for children who are younger than 5 older than 5 i i use either barrett's or you know as or you know uh, srkt uh, for me that has worked well and uh, i think probably everybody can have an access to two or more formulas and look at it and come to a thing but there has been no consensus or no clear advantage of one formula over other in an age group which is younger than 3 thank you very much doctor that was very i have one question so one question one question i think uh, should we take questions we have so many speakers i oh. think i went quite wrong by being very relaxed in the beginning but i want to hear all of them at least for the effort put uh, so very sorry we'll keep the questions for end uh, we we'll go on to our next speaker dr leela mohan who's a chief consultant surgeon comtrust eye hospital koikod kerala a uh, dear friend and we look forward to hearing her talk on weakening procedures on the inferior oblique muscle on to you dr leela thank you so much uh, dr chitra uh, for including me in this wonderful uh, session uh, you can see my slides yes yes, yes. okay so inferior oblique overaction or over elevation in adduction as is termed by simas classification presents with a v pattern and extorted fundus primarily uh, primary bilateral inferior oblique overaction is seen in long standing horizontal strabismus it's not uncommon in infantile strabismus infantile is essential lithotropia uh, where 60 to 70% of them can have present later with inferior oblique overaction and uh, 35% in accommodative lithotropes 30% in exotropes and associated dvd as well may be there and secondary inferior oblique overaction the most common is secondary to superior oblique palsy on the same side or contralateral superior rectus paresis also it can occur no uh, it's not moving i'm sorry you yeah okay so this is a bilateral primary inferior oblique overaction over elevation in adduction is seen in bo um, uh, both eyes with a v pattern and extorted fundus primary uh, primary gaze he had no horizontal deviation but exo in elevation and eso in depression so depending upon the grade of inferior oblique overaction and v pattern we have to decide how much weakening should be there and whether we should touch at all so grade of upshoot in adduction is important this is a, there are various types of grading uh, this is a grading according to the uh, reflex which corresponds to the abducting eye this is the abducting eye with the uh, central reflex and the abducting eye shows a reflex between the pupillary center and pupillary margin uh, grade 2 is at the pupillary margin grade 3 between pupillary margin and limbus and at the limbus is grade 4 unless there is a v pattern uh, of more than 15 prism a grade 1 inferior oblique overaction need not be tackled uh, by surgical correction and just horizontal recess resect may be enough if there is bilateral asymmetric inferior oblique overaction you would do asymmetric recession but if you do a unilateral one the other eye will start uh, upshooting more so in amblyopia and a manifest dvd you may do a unilateral inferior oblique because Uh, the other eye may not uh, uh, manifestly uh, dissociate so in isolating inferior oblique good exposure is important uh, to prevent leaving behind any posterior muscle fibers 
uh, surrounding orbital fat should not be disturbed. Fat adherence can occur, and you should be careful not to disturb the uh, vortex vein also. A meticulous dissection is important to see the posterior fibers. And these are two methods to isolate. You can either place or replace the uh, sutures or uh, uh, put the sutures after uh, severing the muscle. Surgical procedures include recession, temporal myotomy, myectomy, anterior transposition, nasal myectomy, disinsertion, denervation, and denervation extirpation. But myectomy, recession, and anteriorization are, are the most commonly done ones. So coming to myotomy, uh, Z myotomy can be done. In myotomy, you cut between the clamps, uh, cauterize and leave the proximal end to be retracted into its sheath. And in marginal Z myotomy, you uh, clamp the opposite edges in a Z fashion and then cut it and uh, uh, cauterize the edges. In myectomy, after clamping on either side, you cut a, a, a resect about a six to eight millimeters of the segment of the distal muscle and leave it after cauterizing. The main advantage is simple and it is fast and less risky because you are not taking the sutures on the sclera and muscle can get attached to sclera anywhere from insertion. So it is very unpredictable. And recurrence after myotomy can be as high as 70% and myectomy 50%. So uh, a more control weakening is super, uh, inferior oblique recession and uh, oblique, uh, inferior oblique relocation is also possible easier after inferior oblique recession in reoperations. So in grade two inferior oblique overaction, about eight to 10 millimeter of recession, uh, which is the standard one, this is Parks point being measured about two millimeter away from the insertion of inferior rectus and three millimeter uh, inferiorly. It gives about eight to, eight to 10 millimeters of recession. Things uh, you can even measure from the uh, 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 resected muscle. Uh, I mean, the disinserted muscle. And things point to six millimeter below and posterior to the anterior insertion of lateral rectus and corresponds to about four millimeter below inferior rectus. And more, uh, the more anterior is the fibers inserted, the greater is the weakening effect. And asymmetric recession, recession can be done according to the severity of the overaction. And anterior transposition as proposed by Elliot and Ankin the neurofibrovascular bundle mechanically acts as a new origin. It's inserted to the posterior fibers, posterior margin of the middle of the inferior oblique, and uh, a J deformity is created by anteriorizing according to this uh, Elliot and Nankin, that is the insertion is at the uh, insertion of the inferior rectus. And you can see it is parallel to the fibers of the inferior rectus, which creates J deformity. And modification, this usually produces a an anti-elevation effect, which is desirable in some of the cases like DVD when it is manifest or a, so a hypertropia uh, uh, in superoblique palsy. So at the uh, modification is to prevent anti-elevation where the bundles are bunched up instead of spreading it out or the posterior fibers are sutured along the lateral border of the inferior oblique. And it is done, uh, uh, it prevents anti-elevation. So anterior nasal transposition of inferior oblique can be done in recurrences where you isolate the inferior oblique. After hooking the muscle, you suture it about two millimeter nasal to and in, post, uh, inferior to the insertion of the inferior oblique, uh, inferior rectus insertion. And it is done in a very large hypertrophy in primary position or absent superior oblique tendon. And uh, uh, in these cases, it is uh, converted from an extorter and elevator to an intorter and depressor, but anti-elevation apparently is less than in the uh, temporal transposition. Yeah, so this, this is a, an algorithm when there is plus one, about four millimeter beh behind uh, inferior to inferior rectus, plus two, three and two, that is three millimeter posterior and two millimeter lateral is the Parks point, plus three, one to two millimeter posterior to the insertion and plus four at the insertion, as we see here. And oh, in the- You have one minute remaining, ma'am. Okay. So uh, this is a uh, superior oblique paralysis, uh, which produce, uh, you can see the hypertropia, increasing in uh, opposite gaze and uh, Belchowski positive. After superior oblique traction test, which showed uh, negative, uh, we did just an inferior oblique anteriorization and she's completely corrected the head posture and no anti-elevation. But in this case, uh, I'm sorry for that sign. Sorry. Um, uh, 
sorry. Uh, she has some amount of anti-elevation uh, after doing the inferior oblique transposition, but uh, anteriorization. But uh, she is happy because the head posture is gone and primary position and in depression, there is no uh, hypertropia. So complications, uh, residual inferior oblique overaction is the most common one due to missed posterior fibers or even otherwise it can occur as shown by various others to be 46 to 67 percent recurrence may be there. Anti-elevation uh, may be desirable in manifest DVD and uh, superior oblique palsy where there is hypertropia. Fat adherence due to disruption of the orbital fat leads to be a progressive hypertropia, limitation of elevation and positive force duction test and a lid retraction. Ciliary nerve damage can occasionally occur with a temporary uh, pupillary dilatation and injury to lateral rectus or vortex vein, which, is, uh, which are rare. Uh, to summarize, unless there is a definitive over elevation in adduction, you will not touch the inferior oblique. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, okay, that's, that's done almost. Yeah, wonderful talk. Wonderful and so packed with information. Uh, Dr. Veena, shall we take a question or shall we move to the next speaker? We can go to the next speaker, madam. Yeah, she, she really covered it a lot. Uh, we shall now go on to our next speaker, Dr. Elizabeth Joseph, who is the Chief of Pediatric Ophthalmology and Establishment Services from Mittelfarg Flower Hospital, Angamali, and a very uh, well-known popular person in the field of ophthalmology, just not pediatric ophthalmology. So let's hear from her. You have to unmute yourself. What happened? Dr. Elizabeth? One second, I just, uh, will you go for the other talk? I'll, I'll come after that. Yes, you'll come after that. Uh, we shall now go on to Dr. Prachi Agast, Agasti, who is going to be, who's the head of the Pediatric Ophthalmology and Spin Services from Advanced Eye Hospital Institute. Am I wrong? Uh, from Navi Mumbai, Maharashtra. I don't know. Anything wrong? Uh, good evening, ma'am. Yeah, no, ma'am. I am a part of that hospital. So in Bombay, actually, we typically are attached to many hospitals and we are not only one institute. Yeah. So yes, I am a part and I'm the head of the institute over there. That's right. So can I start my talk, ma'am? Yes, yes, yes. Oh. So thank you, ma'am, for the opportunity. And I'll be talking uh, about management of dissociated vertical deviation. Uh, Okay. So, dissociated vertical deviation is a part of the dissociated strabismus complex, which has three components, uh, the vertical, horizontal, and the tor torsional component. The vertical component of it is labeled as a dissociated vertical deviation. As is seen in the video, we can see the eye moving from up to down. Uh, five facts to know about DVD. It indicates an infantile onset of strabismus. It may be associated with profound sensory anomalies. It is always bilateral, though it may be asymmetrical. It is more profound in the amblyopic or the non-dominant eye, and it may be associated with fusion maldevelopment nystagmus, previously called as latent nystagmus. So the clinical presentation is in the form of the patient presenting with upward deviation of the eyes, which may be intermittent or constant and is more during inattention. It may be associated with infantile esotropia or infantile exotropia or Duane syndrome. Uh, the patient may present with an abnormal head posture in the form of a head tilt or chin depression. Head tilt is present in almost 33% of the cases. The head tilt can be to the side of the DVD or a contralateral head tilt with, the, uh, with an attempt to try to uh, decrease the motor component of the DVD. Occasionally, the patient may try to achieve some fusion through the head posture. The sensory adaptations, uh, uh, they are very poor. Stereopsis is typically absent. Suppression is something that is very commonly seen. Peripheral fusion may be present if the deviation is less than four prism diopters and is something that is aimed at in the management. 
the types of DVD include competent versus incompetent versus incompetent DVD, wherein in competent DVD it measures the same across the horizontal gaze in primary position, adduction, and abduction. While in incompetent DVD, the measurements vary across the horizontal gaze with a difference of more than uh, seven prism diopters. Asymmetric versus symmetric DVD is the basically a vertical excursion that we measure in the primary position between both the eyes. As is seen in this video, the DVD is much more uh, present in the left eye as compared to the right eye, with showing an asymmetric DVD in the left eye. So, few tests to diagnose DVD is the Posner's maneuver, wherein when we place a translucent occluder to get the DVD manifested, when we place another occluder on the other eye, uh, both the eyes get uh, realigned. The red filter test is very characteristic, wherein the red dot is always seen below the white dot because it's a dissociative test and the eye behind the red filter is always deviated upwards. And it's a useful test to differentiate from hypertropia. Wilczowski's phenomenon, again, based on a similar principle, when neutral density filters are placed in front of the fixating eye, uh, the hypertropic DVD eye tends to fall. Uh, so, few tests to differentiate from true hypertropia is that the deviation increases under a transfusion occluder as seen in the photograph, the red filter test I talked about. And in the alternate cover test, we see both the eyes moving from up to down, which is not there when a true hypertropia is present. Differences between DVD and inferior oblique overaction uh, should be known. Uh, the, uh, I have listed it in the table. The characteristic one is the V pattern is absent in DVD. Fusion malt development nystagmus is present. In fact, it is sometimes a movement to dampen the nystagmus. And the refixation movement is very slow in DVD as compared to in cases of eye overaction. Quantification is done using the prism bar undercover test, uh, wherein a, a base uh, down prism is placed over the uh, elevating eye and uh, the prisms are increased till the hyper uh, movement is neutralized. Another test utilized is a simultaneous prism undercover test, wherein the occluder as well as the prisms are brought simultaneously to neutralize the deviation. Grading of DVD is as shown. So grade one is a small angle less than five prisms with excellent control. Grade two is up to 10 PD with poorer control. Grade three is poorly controlled DVD measuring more than 10 PD. And grade four is manifest DVD measuring more than 50. Management non-surgical is observation that no intervention for very small DVDs encourage or enhance fusion or Swiss fixation by using uh, techniques to manage amblyopia or certain uh, dichotomic exercises. The surgical management of DVD includes staving the vertical recta as well as the oblique muscles. I have tried to enumerate the scenarios and try to discuss the management. So scenario one is symmetric DVD with good bilateral vision with no oblique muscle dysfunction. Uh, the superior rectus can be recessed with or without addition of a fardin. The inferior rectus can be resected. We can go in for bilateral IO antero positioning even though there is no overaction. And a four oblique weakening procedure as suggested by Gaming. Scenario two, bilateral DVD with deep unilateral amblyopia. So unilateral procedure can be done in the form of superior rectus recession or inferior rectus resection or inferior oblique anterior positioning. Scenario three, symmetric DVD with bilateral inferior oblique overaction with V pattern. So uh, only a uh, unilateral, uh, the inferior obliques need to be uh, weakened by using a resection with IOAT or a graded uh, recession as enumerated by uh, Madam. And when there is a concurrent hypertropia, then the SR recession of the hypertropic eye needs to be done. Scenario four is DVD with superior oblique overaction and A pattern. Uh, here, bilateral SR recession alone may be uh, sufficient when the A pattern is small. When it is larger, then bilateral SR recession with SA, uh, bilateral SO phenectomy can be done. And a four oblique weakening procedure can be done when it is associated with large angle horizontal tropias. So the doses for SR recession are as uh, enumerated again over here. They range from say five millimeters to nine millimeters. These are very unconventional doses of superior rectus recession, but work very well. And the good part is they do not induce a hypotropia. Uh, another point to be uh, highlighted is whenever we are doing a surgery for DVD, especially in long-standing cases, an FTT is must to rule out the contracture. So DVD is generally bilateral and requires to be tackled in both the eyes. Unilateral surgery may result in DVD being manifested in the other eye. Exceptions are in a severely amblyopic eye and asymmetric surgeries to be done where asymmetric presentations are present. A unique form of DVD is a hypotropic DVD, which wherein the eye deviates downwards. It's mostly unilateral associated with vision loss or high myopia and surgical corrections involves recessing the inferior rectus. So the complications of these surgeries could be lid retractions, anti-elevation syndrome, or inversion of the A pattern uh, 
in the given procedures. So they need good surgical techniques to avoid these complications. So to summarize, DVD is a special ocular motility disorder with spontaneous upward drifting of the eye, indicative of infantile onset of strabismus. It is typically bilateral, though may be asymmetrical. Management is aimed to convert a manifest deviation into latent one and achieve some peripheral fusion. And surgery involves tackling of the vertical recti or the oblique muscles as per the presentation. Thank you. Oh, that was uh, wonderful and so well within time. Uh, Dr. Veena, do we take yes. a question? Only one question, ma'am. Yes. Uh, Prachi, do you yes, encounter any overcorrection with IO uh, recession with anterior positioning, especially in envelopes? Overcorrection? No, ma'am. Hmm. No. no. And uh, you uh, switch the fixation with plus two diapter lenses or any other uh, method? Which fixation is my amlapia treatment wherein the vision is good or I have used uh, dicoptic exercises in certain situations where the deviation is otherwise less or in each, after surgery when we are getting some fusion and the asymmetricity of the DVD is very less. That is the only chance that a patient can see. Thank you. Uh, we shall now go on to our next speaker, Dr. Fatima, who is a... Uh, shall, I, shall I present? Oh, yeah. I'm so sorry. So, 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 so. Yes, yes. Go ahead. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Chitra, for uh, including me in this presentation, in this webinar. Uh, uh, this uh, webinar involves uh, a galaxy of excellent strabismologists India has, and I'm again thankful for being here. My talk is on taming the superior oblique, my take. The superior oblique surgery is one of the most challenging of all the strabismus surgeries, and this will require a thorough knowledge of the anatomy. I and the strabism yeah. strabismologists have to be uh, having extensive experience, and uh, the preoperative decision making is also very important. The common indications for superior oblique surgeries are Brown syndrome, A pattern superior oblique overaction, superior oblique palsy. And the common procedures are superior oblique chicken suture, silicon band expansion technique, Z plasty, split tendon lengthening, all done for browns. Superior oblique, oblique partial tenectomy, uh, mainly reserved for A pattern strabismus. And then there is the superior oblique tuck, paradigm procedure, superior oblique advancement, etc., done for superior oblique palsies. When we are doing a congenital brown, um, in the mild and moderate cases, I would say that we better not do anything for the mild and moderate types of browns because uh, the chance of uh, down gaze diplopia and the superior oblique palsy is very high. Absolute indication for surgery is a severe case with uh, a lot of uh, head tilting and primary position hypertropia. And in my hands, the best uh, procedure for superior oblique uh, in brown syndrome is superior oblique chicken suture or a tendon spacer. Both these procedures are controlled surgeries compared to other uh, surgeries. The tenectomy is nowadays not done. Um, the most, uh, the highest success rate, uh, I think, is with uh, these two procedures or with a split tendon lengthening. And here, iatrogenic superior oblique palsy is very rare. I will show you a small video clipping of this that is gone, superior oblique palsy. Video is not playing. Yeah, uh, before doing a superior oblique chicken suture, we have to do a force reduction test. Make sure that your diagnosis is correct. There is a restriction of elevation in the adducted position. Only then you take it up for surgery. And here you can see that the superior rectus is exposed. Superior oblique is in my uh, muscle hooks. And you can see a non-absorbable non suture being passed on one end of the superior oblique. And after that, you make a loop of this uh, suture material 8 to 12 millimeters and then you pass the same suture uh, 5 millimeters apart uh, from the first suture uh, involving the entire width of the superior oblique and uh, you can see that the loop is made and now we will pass the suture through the, uh, the other 5 millimeters apart from the superior oblique 
and then we are planning to cut the superior oblique muscle in between this uh, uh, two sutures these two sutures will prevent a consecutive superior oblique palsy and the suture will act as a scaffold uh, for scar that can keep the cut end of the tendon away after doing that a force reduction has just has to be done now you can see that the sutures are placed and now the uh, genotomy is completed after doing the genotomy completely you do a force reduction test again and make sure that the force reduction is negative uh, and then uh, most probably the surgery will be successful so this is uh, one post operative picture you can see that this is a left crown syndrome with absence of elevation after the surgery on the first post operative day elevation has improved and this is another person who has got a, a right brown underwent the surgery this is the post op picture one and a half years later you can see the cosmetic improvement very remarkable so this can result in a good uh, result now coming to the, the other uh, commonly done procedure superior oblique tongue tuck which is done for under action and uh, tuck will be done in superior oblique palsy where there is a laxity of the tendon i i think i don't have to uh, show the tuck uh, in detail because uh, dr minakshi has already shown the tuck but one or two points before doing the tuck we mark the 12 o'clock uh, 6 o'clock and 12 o'clock meridians on the limbus and after the tuck, uh, tuck make sure that it has become slightly indented the extortion has to uh, become a little bit of indented and after the tuck always do a post reduction tuck post reduction test and make sure that you have not created an iatrogenic browns so this is how we do the tuck a non absorbable suture is used and um, if you want to do an 8 mm tuck a 4 mm measurement is taken and uh, a non absorbable suture is used just like this a post reduction test has to be done after that and uh, you can see the uh, pre op uh, picture you can see the child has got a head tilt with primary position hyper and uh, after the surgery you can see that the primary position hyper is corrected uh, and uh, the head tilt is corrected here i have done an inferior oblique recession along with the superior oblique tuck hyoidectomy procedure i would like to show, show the video because uh, it was not shown early here uh, in hyoidectomy procedure the principle is that the anterior fibers of the superior oblique are the dorsal fibers so in case of a uh, um, uh, congenital superior oblique palsy where torsion is a predominant factor you do surgery involving only the anterior fibers here you can see that the superior oblique muscle is split into the anterior fibers and posterior fibers and then the anterior fibers are isolated like this as far posterior as possible and then a suture is placed there and the uh, anterior fibers of the superior oblique is brought towards the lateral rectus muscle if there is a only a preoperative torsion of about 10 degree the surgery will work well if there is more than 10 degree probably it's a bilateral superior oblique palsy where you have to do the other eye also or in ca in case if there is more torsion you have to tackle the superior rectus uh, in addition to the superior oblique uh, anterior uh, in addition to the uh, hyoidectomy you can do an anterior superior oblique tuck also in similar condition anterior superior oblique tuck and coming to posterior tenectomy uh, this surgery is uh, uh, is done uh, uh, to uh, to correct the superior oblique overaction associated with the uh, a patent strabismus and there is no risk of superior oblique palsy here here the posterior fibers of the superior oblique is cut you can see the video of posterior uh, tenectomy uh, here only the posterior uh, your this is the uh, exposure uh, you uh, expose the superior rectus first and then you go to the superior oblique uh, after the one minute remaining one minute more yeah you can see the superior oblique uh, the entire superior oblique in my muscle book and you here you cut the posterior fibers head on that is the posterior tenectomy of the superior oblique you can see the we are cutting the a quadrilateral piece of the uh, posterior fibers and uh, now i conclude uh, this talk by uh, giving you my uh, take in superior oblique surgery one thing is that uh, when you do superior oblique be careful that
that there is a risk of inducing new vertical and torsional deviation. So you uh, reserve your superior oblique surgery um, only to the deserving patients. If there is in bifovial fixators, whether the patient has got good, patient, good fusion, be careful. And uh, during superior oblique surgery, an intraoperative FDT should be done to prevent an iatrogenic back, uh, browns. And intraoperative monitoring of torsion is also important. And um, a good clinical outcomes occurs in appropriate clinical indications and in selected cases. The, so, uh, the choice of the surgical measure, uh, method should be individualized to avoid complications. With thank that, you. I'm stopping my talk. I, I think I kept the time. Thank you very much. Thank you. And a wonderful talk also. So crisp and so definite. Um, I'm going to go on to our next speaker, Dr. Yes. Fatima, who's a... a Medical consultant, pediatric and, uh, and ophthalmology in adults, Travis Services from Arvind Eye Hospital, Ternal Valley. On to you, doctor. Can you share your presentation? Yeah. She is going to be talking on ectopia lentis management. What's happening? Can you unmute yourself? You're not even. Oh, yes, madam. Good evening, madam. Sorry. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. I'll just sharing uh, sharing the. Yeah. Mm. Um, yeah, coming to the topic, ectopia lentis management. Uh, it is the malposition of the natural lens caused by defect in ciliary zonules. So how do we manage? First, we have to pick up, pick up the early sign of subluxation, the, that is progressive lenticular myopia and astigmatism. It occurs because of the zonular disruption leading to increase in lens curvature and tilting of lens. And, and uh, even otherwise in Marfan syndromes and other syndromes, it can occur due to long axial length. So mild subluxation, uh, we have to carefully note in Sitlam the clear space between iris and lens. Some even advocate three-piece uh, gonio mirror to find out the space between the lens and iris. Uh, only if we pick up that uh, ectopia lentis, we will look for this ocular association and uh, particularly the systemic associations. Um, among the list, uh, Marfan is the first common and isolated ectopia lentis is the second common. And disorder like these are um, more, uh, will cause more neurological uh, dis uh, problem in, even in the infancy. So only these will present, may present to us for the first time. So about uh, Marfan's, uh, we have to diagnose based on the revised Gent criteria, where with, uh, with the presence of family history, it is quite easy to diagnose. In the absence of family history, one has to rely upon the echo finding, uh, particularly of the aortic orifice. More emphasis is on the aortic orifice dilatation, the, the Z score. It is nothing but uh, uh, the uh, calculation based on the pediatric normative, normative data according to the child's age. And, and it is very important to know about the ectopia lentis syndrome also because uh, when the echocardiography is normal, we may label at, it as isolate, isolated ectopia lentis, but it could be ectopia lentis syndrome uh, if there is FBN1 mutation. Uh, since our patients, all the patients will not be affordable for genetic analysis, this is the practical difficulty to differentiate between uh, ectopia lentis syndrome and isolated because uh, even this has cardiovascular risk. Uh, every visit, it is important to document the type and amount of subluxation following any type of grading so that we will find out the progression of the uh, subluxation. And again, homocystinuria, it is very important as mentioned by our anesthetist Ravi sir, uh, that anesthetic complication. So in all ectopia lentis cases in our uh, hospital, we do serum homocysteine level to rule out uh, this disorder and anesthetic complication. It is a rare syndrome and more often we can we will encounter microspirophakia. So mild subluxation, uh, we can manage conservatively, refractive error, anisometropia management, amblyopia. We have to remember it will, it is progressive. 
it may, it may be progressive so we have to follow up moderate moderate we may say when it comes up to the midline of the pupil so numerous concerns diplopia lens induced aberrations both hyperopic and myopic shadow will be obtained in the retinoscopy so there are two options now we can uh, save the bag or go for lensectomy uh, how to save the bag we can have a modified acyonic capsular tension ring implantation uh, this video uh, recently published in ijo uh, video uh, february issue uh, one can i have just fast forwarded for the want of time and uh, rexus is the key important thing and one can choose acyonic uh, ring either of uh, two designs are there right and left design um it will have a fine tiny offset that sony hook will have so it is very quite easy to flip the ring and insert so the orientation is very important and uh, the to uh, keep everything under conjunctiva i have made that uh, scleral groove uh, after opening the conjunctiva and after passing the this is two similar cases uh, but introducing different uh, sony type uh, ring so we have to take care which end has to go first based upon the orientation of the csio uh, and ctr it's quite easy the the question mark sign, kind of sign should be there if we look from this side that that's the key thing and uh, this particular clip uh, i wanted to show when uh, to tackle the sub incisional rexus because rexus is very important uh, we can go to the opposite side and make a paracentesis and introduce micro instrument to pu pull the rexus and complete the rexus and even we can go for hoffman pocket in case of uh, uh, grown up children and it is important uh, to mark the hoffman pocket so that the uh, needle uh, when we pass will go into that yeah i just wanted to show this thing so that we will pass the needle into that and vitrectomy whenever needed we have to do uh, most often it is not required pediatric vitreous will be very good particularly more younger children and here is our data where uh, average age, age uh, our range age range is 4 to 20 years and 19 eyes we have seen uh, all kind of uh, subluxation and um, that that uh, seven percent uh, seven cases required a uh, capsulectomy and the best visual uh, median value is six by nine in the last follow-up and our av average follow-up is 22.5 months and again in literature also there is good result mentioned in three years outcome this clip is just to, to show the cts here uh, because being an aniridia case we can uh, uh, we can understand how much the cts tamponades how many clock hours and again cts we can use instead of ct uh, cony when we want to introduce through the device through the side port small side port because it is being introduced through nasal aspect uh, now the you can we can see that uh, bag is dipping down so in such case instead of iris hook we can use even cts to pull and uh, stabilize the bag and uh, lead into the uh, bag and place the eye wheel so advantage of bag conservation is lower rate of vitreous prolapse and lower rate of retinal detachment so even literature says sutured scleral fi fixation shows 30% of breakage and dislocation of eye wheel in, in marfan syndrome patient uh, vasavada et al had uh, mentioned 13% of decentration with the cony ctr implantation at least in cony ctr decentration is more common than dislocation which can be resutured so disadvantage of back conservation uh, pco and uh, uh, those ctr delays pco formation uh, yeah capsulectomy can be done and the gross subluxation can lead on to hyperopic shift but even then we have to remove the lens because the lens can dislocate into vitreous and cause complication or a positional angle closure and glaucoma can occur lensectomy uh, when there is gross subluxation uh, it is uh, no other choice if it is more than half uh, the diameter of the cornea it has climbed up so uh, in the mens in the lensectomy the important thing is we have to make a small opening at least a partial rexis or complete rexis Uh, usually it is our practice uh, start by my mentor uh, dr meena shri madam that rexis 
uh, we practiced in the lens yeah, yeah, cases yeah yeah so that uh, yeah, it, sure. it was useful in other ectopia lentis cases to make rexis properly and uh, lens ectomy less surgical time we can give some time for stabilization of iol power and go for secondary iol later and uh, post operative care after lens ectomy is anisometropia management by contact lens and amblyopia management the secondary iol can be in the form of iris claw iol uh, come in two different uh, companies and our iris fixation iol and scleral fixation there are numerous uh, techniques have been uh, published and uh, but the thing is uh, long term follow up in pediatric patient is the issue uh, i like to conclude uh, based on this article like outcome of three surgical post procedures are compared here uh, one is uh, coni ctr another is sutured scleral fixation another one is uh, intra scleral fixation of iol so finally they have concluded all the three uh, so no significant difference in the post operative result and complication so one as it is a surgeon's comfort one can choose either of the procedure and treat patient accordingly thank you thank you so much yeah wonderful talk wonderful you try to do so much in the uh, seven minutes but just one question you can't do a, a p uh, uh, primary posterior okay. capsulotomy because you put a cni ring and a, or a cts so i suppose uh, because these capsules can opacify also fast so does yes. it make sense to conserve the capsular bag at the it's uh, the intent of protecting the posterior segment or uh, would yes, you madam uh, yeah, uh, yes madam in our uh, experience in this uh, 21 eyes uh, C, uh, pco occurrence is delayed up to 2 years probably because of the ctr placement the ctr in the bag probably delays the migration of the lens equator epithelial cells uh, into the center that would be we, we, we even we were worried initially to do many number of cases with this technique but uh, luckily uh, we are able to manage uh, one and a half to two years only the children require even we do yakap only even at the mild stage of uh, opacification we don't allow for thick so that we will not this uh, you more uh, distraction to the coni so we, that is the good point in that thank you uh, uh, do you like encounter uh, uh, decentration after yakap no madam no we have done seven cases uh, uh, like fortunately we will do very cautiously and i mean in a low energy and that's why uh, prefer doing in the low uh, mild opacification itself not allowing for a thicker opacification thank you thank you we shall go on to our next speaker dr sandra who is a you, medical consultant thank you Medical Consultant, Pediatric Ophthalmology and Adult Establishment Services from Arvind Eye Hospital, Coimbatore, another very dynamic surgeon. And let's hear what she's going to be talking on, what's new in amblyopia management. On to you, Dr. Um, Sandhya. Yes, thank you very much. Um, just a minute. And just a minute. What's happening? Sandra? Sandra, what's happening, Sandra? Uh, ma'am, uh, just uh, give me one minute, madam. Uh, just trying to go into the slide share. The slide okay. is sharing. Yeah, yeah. I'm just uh, trying to present. Uh, you're not getting that icon here. Yeah, I'll do one thing. I'll just present like this. Yeah, I, do like that. I don't yeah. have any videos. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm going to talk about the recent advances in amblyopia management. Yeah. So, amblyopia is one condition where <clears throat> we uh, the applications of artificial in intelligence is going to be really high uh, in the next couple of years. So, I do not have any financial uh, interest in uh, any of the products shown in this presentation. So coming to the question of why treating amblyopia is very important because 
the deficit in amblyopia extends beyond the monocular visual acuity impairment into a lot of higher order functioning, which includes binocular vision, fixation, instability, and abnormal binocular interactions. And for certain fields, like uh, for especially with fields like aviation and surgery, uh, the 3D depth perception is extremely important. So uh, what are the problems with the traditional therapy? Traditional therapy does remain the gold standard but the problems include poor adherence, especially with regard to compliance. As the age increases, it becomes increasingly difficult for the parents to uh, make the child comply with the patching schedule every evening, especially when it comes to severe amblyopia. There is a lot of psychosocial impact and stigma. So atropine uh, is the other alternative, but it causes light sensitivity and reverse amblyopia, and there is a lot of systemic side effects. And with uh, traditional therapies, there is difficulty in achieving true equalization. It does not uh, address suppression, and uh, definitely we get only some improvement in the visual acuity and no uh, 3D uh, effects. So all the newer therapies with regard to uh, amblyopia are uh, dependent on neuroplasticity. So the basic idea about neuroplasticity came when people used to get injured in the good eye and lost the vision. And later on, it was found that even in the adult age group, the amblyopic eye used to improve and the vision used to uh, increase. So the plasticity of a brain does not end after a certain age and a lot of lateral connections are possible. So the newer concepts with regard to amblyopia is that it is more of a binocular rather than a monocular disease. Hence, it is necessary to find stimuli and ways to uh, stimulate the spe uh, specific plasticity of the adult brain. And the most common ways we are doing it now are by perceptual learning or by di dicoptic therapy. So the newer amblyopia treatment falls into active or passive ways of treating and active ways include perceptual learning, which includes dicoptic video games, aclupad, iBit, or the vivid vision, and the passive therapies, which includes dicoptic movies and the pharmacological adjunct therapy. So what do you mean by uh, this perceptual learning that was uh, discovered way back by Leonard Gibson in the 80s? And that depends on the adage that practice makes perfect. So when you do repeated tasks, uh, like sensory tasks, and that can improve the vision in the amblyopic eye, so they use stimuli like the Gabos patches and letter optotypes. And the neural basis for this is that there is a reduction in the lateral inhibition with the brain with training. So this was developed as neurovision therapy originally in Israel in 1999. And the Gabo filters are used to stimulate and activate the receptive fields in the visual cortex by Dennis Gabor. And he got a Nobel Prize actually for this discovery. So why this uh, stimulus is being used? Because it is the most effective stimulation of the primary vision cortex. And individually designed frequency, spatial arrangement, contrast levels, orientation and exposure durations are uh, possible. And it is US FDA approved. And Neurovision has purchased uh, uh, by the Revital Vision, which is based in the US in 2009. So uh, it is an in-home um, use on patient's own uh, personal computer. And the software will measure the contrast threshold of the Gabo target with the flankers in the first two tests that they do. And then the patient has to identify which display has the three Gabo targets. So here you can see the target display with the flankers. And for amblyopia, around 40 sessions are recommended with four sessions a week. And there is an average of two lines of visual acuity with 100% improvement in contrast sensitivity. So uh, it doesn't limit to amblyopia. Even they say that 20 sessions are useful in improving the contrast sensitivity as in uh, post lasic patients and even post multifocal patients, it can be uh, tried uh, very well is what the company is uh, saying. So um, this is the study which they uh, put out in 2000-2001, where uh, the mean best corrected vision uh, in the amblyopic eye after treatment improves uh, to 0.41, uh, improves to 0.17 from 0.41 log mark. And in the control group, as you can see, it remains the same. And the improvement in the vision is maintained even a year after treatment, is what they said way back in 2001. But some uh, drawbacks of perceptual learning can be that the improvement are noted to be specific to the trained task and not necessarily transverse to novel tasks. And always these studies are limited to very small number of participants. So we don't know whether it works in a larger group of patients. So coming to the perceptual uh, dicoptic stimuli. In perceptual uh, stimuli, we use a single type of stimuli to both the eyes, whereas in dicoptic, it presents independent stimuli to each other. Uh, as you can see in the pictures, you need integration of both the stimuli. Under binocular viewing conditions, it uses a red-blue glasses. So the contrast of the luminous input to the fellow eye, that is amblyopic eye, um, the good eye is reduced to match the performance of the amblyopic eye. 
And as the patient is uh, developing binocular vision, so the contrast uh, difference is reduced and uh, there is an improvement in visual acuity and also similarly uh, with binocularity and contrast sensitivity. So these are a few of the games that are based on the dichoptic uh, stimuli, including the Tetris games, which was originally uh, discovered uh, in the uh, 2010 around. And uh, these studies uh, and the Digraj games, these are all have been studied in ADS uh, 1820 and Bravo, which is the binocular uh, treatment of amblopia using video game study. But they all did not report a significant difference between um, the games and the traditional methodology for uh, the treatment of amblopia. So coming to virtual reality-based systems, which include the IBIT, which is developed by a group in Nottingham, and that's based on three different mechanisms presenting yeah, fine. Well. Um, yes, sure. Thank you. By presenting fine and mobile stimuli to the amblyopic eye and uh, fix the targets to the dominant eye, one half of the image is shown to each eye, and they play these virtual reality based games with improvement in the visual acuity. So again, we have the ocular uh, pad or the tab, which in which in the iPad air, you can remove the polarization. And then the patient is asked to wear certain polarized glasses and play games. But it has been studied only in five patients. And they improved uh, vision uh, to uh, by an average of 0.38 log mark after two months of treatment. And there's a new company called Vivid Vision in San Francisco, USA who has developed the games. Again, um, these are virtual reality based and they claim to get around 1.5 log mark improvement. So these are dichotic movies which are passive, which can just be watched. So here the range is really big because any games can be, any movies can be seen with this. And so the compliance is really good. Coming to Binox, uh, they have recently, they have revamped the system uh, to uh, named it as Amblay Go. The earlier uh, games were only three in number and now it's more than five or six and they are more interesting. And so you have to play these games for 30 to 40 minutes, at least five times a week. And the initial improvement is seen um, quite fast and a good result can be expected in six to eight weeks in appropriate cases. And again, they can claim that the visual acuity can improve by four log mar lines and improve the stereopsis. So pharmacological therapy shall skip it because it's not really a recent advance. And uh, then you have this intermittent liquid crystal glasses, which can turn on and off many times a day. And uh, it's just a passive uh, treatment. And you can have new devices which can monitor the adherence to patching in children, which uh, again, there is not a lot of big studies on this, but uh, this will help you to exactly note how much the patient is patching. So to conclude, there has been a lot of technological advancement in the last decade, and but a lot of studies are needed because these are limited to very few patients. And if there is a, a wider study with a global study of amblopia, then we uh, give uh, more uh, um, information on this. And also it will help us to better define and categorize amblopia. The thing is the newer games and all these uh, later uh, binocular integrated therapies can help us to improve the vision by three or four months itself. Whereas in the traditional teaching of amblopia, so we have to uh, breed for years together. So that is the uh, only uh, good uh, advantage of uh, using these newer modes of uh, therapy. Thank, Thank you, you very much. I just want one question because you're so detailed in your talk. Uh, what is the hope for our adult uh, amblyopias? Yes, all these treatments are possible very much for adult amblyopia. In fact, I try many of these uh, treatments for adult amblyopia. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, it, uh, it you can improve even in cases where we traditionally think that is not possible as in strabismic amblyopia. But the important thing to remember is we need to do surgery and align the eyes first. So uh, with the presence of a strabismus, it is not possible to do it. So either in small angle, we can give prism or we can do surgery, align the eyes, and then we have seen quite a few uh, cases where it improves by two or three lines also. I think anisometropic amblyopias would do better, I think. Yeah, those are the easiest to treat. So for them, patching can be um, first line, especially as a child. But uh, it is better to try these therapies once or we can use that as an adjunct also. If the parents are really finding it very difficult, we can uh, use these as an adjunct also. Thank you very much, Sandra. We Thank shall you. now go on to Dr. Rohit, who is going to take us to a more complex area, managing resurgeries, a simplified approach. Sorry, Rohit, for running it so late, but look forward to all your talks. No, it doesn't matter. Uh, thank you. In fact, I wanted to say that uh, a lot of this has actually already been covered. Uh, uh, so you can see my slides. Yeah, yeah. So... Uh, Talking about complications, a lot has already been discussed, so I'll take on the most important aspect of complications, which is avoiding them. 
complications can be by omission which means misdiagnosis and faulty planning and of course it could be by commission where we have avoidable or unavoidable surgical mishaps so we we'll just talk about preventing complications the key is to remember the don'ts don't operate pseudo strabismus do not operate accommodative esotropias refraction check for alignment with the corneal light reflex to rule out pseudo strabismus in a child coming with a possible strabismus do complete ocular motility do not do not miss the obliques over time these obliques even if you align them in primary gaze if there is a residual oblique over action over time that will decompensate and result in a recurrence of the deviation so a long term residual or a wrong long term recurrence is bound to be there if you miss the obliques uh, even in partially accommodative remember do not operate for the accommodative part only operate for the non accommodative or the fixed esotropia it's important because over time the refractive error will decrease and the child can go into an overcorrection always remember when not to operate in acquired acute presentations of paralytic strabismus wait for adequate period of time for stabilization we have seen late improvement in many cases of traumatic and uh, medical causes of paralysis so wait for at least 6 months for stabilization of the deviation more often than not you may not require to intervene often the fault is in our examination techniques remember how to place the prisms is very important appropriate positioning giving proper targets and measuring it repeatedly is important faulty techniques result in faulty faulty outcomes uh remember to check for the refractive error in high refractive errors you are going to have the amount of deviation being measured differently so errors are there if there are more than four or five diopters of refractive error because looking through uh, the spectacles of large powers there is a prismatic effect that can result in the deviations being over measured in minus lenses or under measured in plus lenses always remember safe limits there are limits to what we can achieve and same is true for recession and resections if you do less than the minimum uh, approved for recession the effect will be not there if you do more than the maximum it goes beyond the arc of contact and the muscle actually acts like a retractor and there is gross under action of movement resections if you resect more than the maximum you are actually losing out on myofibrils which is a part of a weakening procedure also therefore your results are not going to be better you may actually be less effective if you do more than the maximum that has been recommended in acquired strabismus always always wait identify the cause be sure that it is not going to improve spontaneously very often you may have to require to see old photographs to make sure that it was a congenital deviation because sometimes patients just notice a deviation or parents will notice a deviation often this has happened in duans because the child will not complain of uh, diplopia and suddenly in some photograph the parents will notice that the eye is not going on the side and they come to you as an acute acquired esotropia but in truth it is a long standing or it's a congenital defect but again it's important to make sure the etiology behind any deviation ask for variability in an adult strabismus presenting often uh, it may mim- uh, the myasthenia can mimic anything in fact the dictum goes if you cannot understand the type of paralytic strabismus it's probably myasthenia be sure of your diagnosis don't ro- operate in inappropriately uh, often duans is confused with a sixth nerve palsy uh, duans has been well discussed it has been discussed that uh, it has been recommended that small amount of resections you can get away with but still the normal dictum uh, really is that you should not resect the lateral rectus and if you confuse it with a lateral rectus palsy and you do a large resection you're going to land up in major post op complications identify associated problems we talked about oblique overactions identify dvd because the vertical deviations are going to remain post op and they need to be operated or managed appropriately uh, dr prachi has very nicely talked about dvd so the uh, these are all you, what you can prepare with when you are, when you start your surgery anesthesia is something that is important general anesthesia has been discussed it's important to for us to know about local anesthesia problems uh, uh, the uh, you should be sure that the child patient is not allergic to the uh, injectable 
uh, LA that you are giving in bilateral surgery, it is important that you do not give him excess amount of anesthesia. If bilateral surgery is is to be done, stagger the block, operate one eye after a bit, operate the other eye, or else give infiltrative local anesthesia instead of the uh, retrobulbar block or peribulbar block. Avoid the problem of wrongs. Wrong muscle. Remember, orientation of the globe is very important. It gets distorted, particularly in fornix. Uh, incisions that I've had a couple of times, the SR pointing out that the muscle looks a little odd and it's probably the wrong muscle that they have hooked. Observe the insertions. The SR and IR have slanting insertions, except for MR, all recti have associated obliques. So when in doubt, check for these things. Wrong eye, wrong surgery, wrong patient, of course. Make sure repeatedly check the records and display it in front of you when you start your surgery. Uh, Tech to vision is possible in glow perforations vitreous hemorrhage and endophthalmitis. Glow perforations are not so uncommon and it's important that you use the spatulated needles and of course operate under microscope so that you're able to see everything. You should see the tip of the needle as it is going through the passage through the sclera. Deep passage should be avoided. When there is thin sclera, marfans or previously operated, you may think of a hangback or a hemming hangback. And the slight giveaway feeling is the suspicion that there is a perforation. The moment you have a doubt, press for a little while. While you are operating, dilate the pupil, screen the retina, mark the site of perforation so that you can identify a hemorrhage or a break. And of course, consult with your retina specialist how you can manage if there is a problem. Cryo used to be the earlier modality. Now, of course, you can do a laser. Anterior segment ischemia occurs if you operate more than three or more muscles. Uh, first day post of your, you'll start seeing corneal edema, flare cells. Uh, it's of course important not just more than uh, three or more muscles. Also, the general uh, uh, health of the patient. Patients with uh, medical problems, hypertension, diabetes, are anyway having vessels that are atherosclerotic, so maybe higher prone to anterior segment ischemia. Do not operate on three or more muscles in the single sitting. Try vessel sparing surgery. Plications we've discussed may be less uh, uh, traumatic or less harmful to the vascular supply. Vertical recti have more anterior ciliary vessels but are not backed by posterior ciliary arteries and older patients may be more susceptible. So obviously, if you suspect you start oral and systemic steroids and cycloplegics immediately, usually the patient would recover, especially if it's a young patient. End of is an unfortunate complication. Of course, it's important to just be careful while you're preventing it and you can manage it uh, like you would any uh, uh, patient with end off or a, um, uh, uh, orbital infection. Uh, frequently seen but self-limiting would be suture reactions, hemorrhages, lid edemas, corneal abrasions. Be careful about. Sometimes you miss them and there is a lot of edema next day post-op. So it's important to look for abrasions and delins, which usually would heal uh, easily. Delins are more common with a limbal incision. Acceptable ones would be small under over corrections, lid fissure anomalies, light incompetence, and sometimes diplopia and extreme gaze. So this is a case of a, you can see post-operative palpable fissure difference. The patient initially came with large angle esotropia, but post-surgery, he was only concerned about the fissure difference. And he probably felt that his squint was better than the fissure difference that he had post-operatively. So be careful, particularly when you're operating vertical recti you may get significant fissure differences in the post-op period. Some other issues like allergic reactions or chronic granuloma to the suture, uh, which are not uncommon. Uh, now, of course, uh, with vitreal, uh, there is not so much likelihood, but sometimes if you leave, leave a large suture uh, at the knot, you may have a significant suture reaction, usually resolves with topical steroids and antibiotics. Rarely, you may need to excise uh, a cyst that can get formed, something like this would require an excision. Uh, lost muscle, of course, long-standing squints, taut, tight rectal, uh, recti. Uh, it can happen. Uh, we've just, uh, discussed as CFUMs, and the medial rectus is the most likely to get lost. Obviously, while the prevention is the only real thing you can do while pass, passing sutures, do not pull. Do not ask your assistant to pull too much. Pass sutures early, a little posterior to the insertion. And of course, in thin atrophic muscles, it's very likely. Uh, usually, I haven't seen very su great success in being able to identify and retrieve a lost muscle. So essentially, you may do a muscle transfer procedure uh, later on subsequently uh, if required. 
The other important thing is a slip muscle. Uh, like in this case, you can see the medial rectus was recessed. You can see the severe adduction deficit and widening of the palpable fissure that occurs on attempted adduction in this case. So it's important to identify that early. You can prevent it by taking suture bites a little behind the insertion or your clamp. Uh, have good uh, long scleral tracks and use a proper surgeons not to tie it. Uh, under corrections, over corrections sometimes are desirable, sometimes they may not be. You may initially try optical means to manage by glasses, altering the refractive error or prisms. And of course, if there is significant under over correction or if the patient has diplopia, you may require to, uh, to reoperate the patient either using the same muscles or the other eye or other unoperated muscles. Wound gape or tenons uh, prolapse uh, can be a problem in fornix. You may uh, require to close it again, go back and close it again. Sometimes it just sticks. Uh, but in the early post-op, you need to make sure that there is no tenons prolapse, prolapse because that will result in a cyst formation. So essentially to tell you that uh, while all of us have a possibility of complications, it's always important and helps to be prepared. Thank you very much for your attention. Superb talk, uh, uh, Rohit. That was really, truly amazing. Thanks a lot. Uh, we shall now go on to our next speaker, Dr. Shruti Nishant, who is a uh, cataract, pediatric, neuroophthalm, squint surgeon from Chennai MNI Hospital and uh, with a great future ahead. So on to you, Shruti. Yeah. Uh, thank you, ma'am, for this uh, opportunity. So today I'm going to be talking about managing not the COVID pandemic, but the pandemic that followed that, and that's the myopia pandemic. Um, so we know that when Corona came visiting us in 2019, it just bumped up our uh, myopia scales and the incidence of myopia just went um, skyrocketing. So a lot of studies have come in, but this was one of the earliest studies that came in, published in JAMA, where they said that especially in the younger age group, there was almost a 400% increase in 2020, uh, while in the older age group, it was not as much. Uh, so definitely there is an impact. Uh, in fact, there is another study that um, uh, spoke about how atropine, in spite of being on low dose atropine, the myopia progressed in the last two years because of the pandemic, which went to go, which went to say that the environmental factors do play a big role. So before we go on to how to managing myopia, it is important to understand why and how myopia occurs. So myopia is a complex disorder which involves both genetics and environment. So genetics basically decides the age of onset, the rate of progression, and the final refractive error. And if there is one myopic parent, the odds ratio is 1.8. And if there are two, then it is 2.4. But what is more important is on the right side, which is the environment. We know all the factors that are there that play a big role in the progression of myopia. But to put it very simply, if genetics is the loaded gun, the environment is the trigger. So if the if there is an environmental factor, then myopia is the bullet that goes right through. So in when it comes to the environmental factors, there are two important factors that are constantly spoken about. One is the sunlight ex outdoors exposure and the second is the restriction of near work. When it comes to outdoors exposure, the light intensity matters. The higher the light intensity, more than 1000 lux, then the better the, pro, my, uh, the better the myopia control is. Uh, the light wavelength has also been studied to be of importance. That is the red wavelength, is the red color uh, spectrum is uh, found to be more harmful for myopia progression and the uh, violet end is found to be more protective. And of course, increased average viewing distance of objects is found to be a protective factor and movement and sports. So this, what it does is it activates the spatiotemporal image response mechanism. So basically more of the retina that is stimulated the better is the myopia control. And of course, there's a small role played by the sustained pupillary constriction and the increased production of vitamin D. When it comes to near work, the things that we all know are the ambient light, the viewing distance, the blink rate, and the number of hours of continuous viewing. So in spite of these, all these factors, we can all put it into three boxes. That is image quality, whereas a, a blurred image and a poor illuminated image can lead to myopia. A mechanical strain where an increased accommodation and convergence can lead to myopia. And the third is acquired biochemistry or so-called exposomes, which is spoken about now as the, the environment playing a role in myopia, which is nutrition, stress, sleep, and the other part of the environment. And put this together in a box with genetics where they have a family history of myopia. And you have something that is called scleral remodeling, which is the basic pathophysiology of myopia that leads to the progression. 
So it's very important to note that uh, studies have shown that it is a very retinal uh, related issue, the myopia progression and not a central, uh, centrally mediated one. And it's more mediated by the rod mediated signaling more than the cones. And this is an important, uh, uh, an interesting factor where you see that uh, in monocular uh, form deprivation chicks, they found there was an increase in the uh, pro uh, uh, the mediators which promote uh, collagenases uh, at the end of the day 21. And you can see how the collagen has depleted in all these uh, uh, myopic uh, chicks. So yeah, so now that we understand how, why and how myopia works, how can we manage it in our clinic? So the first thing is to identify the patient. So we all know that myopes who are more than 0.5 diopters are definitely a part of the group. Lower than average hyperopes, the so-called at-risk free myopes are the ones also to be included and kids with parental myopia. So it's important to profile our patient with a good uh, you know, questionnaire to know what they are going to, uh, how, what kind of lifestyle they're leading. Uh, it's important to do a subjective objective refraction, a cycloplegic refraction, a good axial length measurement, and a good BV evaluation. In the BV evaluation, it's important to do a cover test to rule out esophorias because near esophorias are associated with high myopia, and a, a MEM retinoscopy, which is nothing but a dynamic retinoscopy, which measures the accommodative lag. So let's go come to some uh, holistic viewing of patients. So this was a four-year-old kid and on our questionnaire had parental myopia, was a bookworm with less outdoors. And on cycloplegic refraction, you can see that there's a very small plus, which is a pre-myope and an axial length, which was normal for age. So this is a patient who would be called a pre-myope. In these children, we give them a good, a lot of uh, lifestyle advice, visual hygiene, vision therapy, and observe them six monthly. Now, this is another patient who's an eight-year-old, and uh, you can see that there's no parental myopia for this child and, you know, a typical uh, increased screen time with an outdoors of one hour a day. Uh, and a cycloplegia shows a minus 0.75 diopters and with axial length appropriately increased. So this patient would fall under the category of a new myope. And in this condition, we would just give them uh, glasses for constant wear and lifestyle advice and observe them six monthly. Now, this child, uh, third child would be a 10-year-old child with no parental myopia. Uh, again, demanding schoolwork, less access to outdoors. But this child has already been under my care for six months. And now in the second visit after six months shows a minus one diopter progression with a corresponding increase in the axial length. Now, this child was what we would call a progressive myope. And in this case, we start, uh, I mean, we change glasses. But here we do some active interventions such as dilute atropine or dims lens. Of course, we have to give lifestyle advice with a slightly closer follow-up. So a little more about atropine would be covered by uh, Dr. Ram Prakash in the first, subsequent talk, but uh, my protocols would be children more than five years with a documented cycloplegic myopic progression of minus 0.5 diopters, and that would uh, make me start them on dilute atropine for two years. I tell them right away that it is a deal for two years. And if they pro don't progress uh, beyond 0.75 diopters, then we continue them for two years, taper and stop it. And if they do progress, which means they are poor responders, then we either increase the dosage to twice a day or we consider DIMS lens. Now, these DIMS lens are the newer lenses that are available. They are called defocus incorporated multiple segments from Hoya. Basically, they correct the hyperopic defocus seen in the myopic uh, posterior pole, which is more oblong rather than spherical. So it consists of lenslets that... Uh, uh, that are like uh, plus 3.5 diopters add in the mid periphery, which creates a myopic defocus, thereby helping the focus be more perfect on the uh, retina in the mid peripheral area. So finally, after all we all this we do, what do we exactly tell the parents? Uh, when it comes to online classes in the last pandemic, you know we have to talk about visual hygiene. So wearing glasses, bigger screens, bigger working distances, frequent blinking, sitting near a window, simple things like good natural lighting, Enlarged font size, 20-20-20 rule, a good posture and monitored outdoor breaks. So this is what we would recommend for online classes. When it comes to lifestyle changes, two hours of outdoor, outdoor time every day, daily routines, a good physical activity, good sleep, diet, hydration. And of course, considering these kids have been in isolation, psychological health. So these are all important. So to the my final slide would be the key keys to managing myopia is to acknowledge the fact that there is an amplified boom. Environmental factors do make a big impact. Understanding the retinal circuitry is key. Scleral remodeling is the primary pathogenesis. Customize the myopia control and consider dilute atropine and dim lens where required. Thank you. Thank you, Madam, for this wonderful opportunity. Oh, that was a wonderful talk. That was really truly uh, enlightening and uh, reinstated a lot of things which you already know. 
So we shall now go on to our uh, last speaker, Dr. Ram Prakash, who's a senior pediatric ophthalmologist from Dr. Mehta Hospital. And he's going to tell us the other side of the coin, low concentration atropin and myopia. Good evening. Over the last few years, there are many options regarding myopic control in pediatric age group. Are these methods effective and justified? Well, it depends on the way you see. Is it a young girl or an old lady? Dr. Shruti has presented a wonderfully on one's view of the same. Surely, there must be another view. Thanks to AOS, Dr. Chitra Ramurthy, Madam, and others for asking me to talk on this topic. I would concentrate on 0.01% atropine because that is the most widely used and only low-dose uh, atropine that is available here. This is a young child whose myopia was progressing year after year. And by 2016, it was concerning and it was decided to do something, following which the myopia began to stabilize. What did we do? Strangely, we did nothing and the myopia spontaneously started slowing down. This slide shows the chances of mild or non-progression taken from different studies. Clearly, these numbers are not small enough to be ignored. And this is more so given the higher date uh, instance in the Indian studies. Myopia is a multifactorial disease, and most of the studies try to address one factor, ignoring the effect of others. And this could lead to a uh, confounding of the results. So, the Indian Atom study, like other studies, studied children whose myopia had progressed by at least 0.5 diopters in the preceding year. Now, look at the placebo group. Even in the placebo group, the progression had dropped to 0.35 diopters, much lesser than the threshold for starting atropine. So, given a child in the OP, how are we going to know whether if this child is going to spontaneously slow down or progress? This is another child whose myopia was progressing, started on low dose atropine in 2019 and the myopia relatively stabilized subsequently. Before terming it as good outcome, let us, let us look at the biometry. Over the same period, the eyeballs had grown by approximately half a millimeter, which is an area of concern. A similar finding, a good effect on spherical equivalent and minimal effect on axial length was found in atom study and lamp studies as well. Besides, the atom study found that the axial length elongation was similar between the placebo and the 0.01% atropine group. This 0.01% atropine a glorified placebo. We all know that the purpose of trying to treat uh, RS myopic progression is to prevent the complications of eye myopia. And this is basically uh, dependent on the axial elongation rather than the spherical equivalent value. Because atropine at 0.01% has a minimal effect on axial elongation, it may not suit the bit. This is a slide that shows the yearly progress rate of two 12-year-old children. Clearly, the boy A has a progress that varies from time to time, whereas boy B has a progression that is steady over the period. Two things from this slide. It shows the importance of having a good long-term follow-up before you start treatment. Most of the studies, for whatever intervention you do, they have only one year pre-treatment data and might miss out on this variation. Second, when you do treat these children, how are you going to compare the results? Because the progression is so variable between the children. Quoting the ATOM study, the duration of myopic progression is intrinsic to each child. And they go on to add that use atropine when the progression is expected to be maximum. Until we have a magic formula, which will tell you when the child is going to progress, by how much, until what age, it's not treating all children with progression and overkill. We know how the traffic signals work. If you see the yellow light, they're supposed to go fast. If you see the red, you still have the license to cross. But if we see green, they're supposed to go slow. Strangely, humans are very unpredictable. Yet, we expect the diseases to behave in a predictable manner. Is myopia a predictable disease? I've been embraced so many times trying to predict how the myopia will behave. Okay, look at the atom table. Look at the values within the bracket. That represents a standard deviation. And most of the cases, the standard deviation is much more than the mean value outside of it. A similar effect in the LAMP study as well. So when you have a disease that is so variable, it becomes difficult to interpret the results and depends on the question that was asked in the first place. In most of the studies, the question that was asked was, is atropine effective or not? Maybe if we change the question and ask, is atropine ineffective or else, who knows, we might have a different answer. This is a child whose myopia was progressing significantly and was treated with low-dose atropine. Now, let us see how we can play with the numbers and how that affects the results. 
So if we take 2018 as the base year, clearly atropine has had a warp effect on controlling myopia. However, the catch here is you are comparing a six month pre-treatment data versus a two years post-treatment data, which may not be the best thing to do. Now let me change the base year to 2017 so that the period becomes comparable. The atropine continues to be effective in the left eye. However, in the right eye, it has increased significantly. So can we say that atropine has potentiated myopia in the right eye? So most of the studies, whatever methods you are going to do, they study myopia only one year before starting the intervention. And they compare it with a period that is variable, one to five years post-treatment. This may not be the best way to compare. Besides, we know that we still do not know the answers to these questions. So until we have the answers, it will not be prudent to reduce the hype around 0.01% atropine. So what do I see? When I'm with my mother, I see the young girl. And when I'm with my daughters, I see the elderly lady. Now, don't ask me what I see when I'm with my wife. I have to see what she sees. No chance. So professionally, I'm committed to the pediatric ophthalmology and the community and its goals. So I do use 0.01% atropine. Is it effective? I think it will be difficult to prove or disprove. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ram Prakash. That was a very nice talk. And it did tell us the dilemma, which we still continue to face, but there were some answers which we got anyway. I think we are running terrifically late. Everybody has to go for dinner or there's going to be no dinner uh, for some of you all. So I think I'm going to conclude. There could have been questions asked for the last topic, but I, they have really spoken everything which was necessary for us to know. So a huge, huge thanks to the expert panel and the extremely wonderful set of speakers I truly think that I started off this webinar asking you all, telling you all that every time a webinar would end, I would think there couldn't have been better than this one. And Rohit actually pulled my leg on that. Mm -hmm. But don't you think this was a wonderful webinar? It's so much of information really? and so diverse and everybody trying their best, trying their best that did actually stay within their time. So it just tells us that India is really, truly, truly well in ophthalmology in all it's like a 360 degree performance. So it's really amazing. And I should, at this point of time, I would like to thank my co-moderator, Dr. Veena, for being so very effective and steering the webinar so well. Thanks to my ARC team, as always, for being my backbone in doing anything well. Uh, thanks are due to our, um, Mr. Kripal and his entire AOS admin team. Thanks are due to Sai and Manjula from Numerotech. You must be seeing all those mails which keep coming to your inbox that tells you how effective and uh, connected they are. My thanks are due to uh, the uh, webinar admin, Dr. Anand Sethi and his team. You can see how tirelessly they keep watching you and timing you and keep updating on the number of people who have attended it. And finally, most importantly, most importantly, our thanks are due to Entoad and the entire team for having been our sponsors for the last two years, so consistently they have been supporting us and never have they asked, is there any end to your webinars? And I'm so, um, so, so indebted to them for the kind of uh, support they have offered to the entire ARC team. Thank you one and all. Thanks so much. It was nice hearing all of you. I don't know about you all. I truly learned a lot today. Thank, thank you, Dr. Chitra. Absolutely thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Chitra. Very, very interesting. Yeah. And wonderful talk, Dr. Ram Prakash. I mean, uh, yeah. I, I would say that, you know, the need of the hour is for us to, you know, step back and actually, you know, yeah. understand what, whether we are doing is making a difference in the real yeah. sense or, yeah. you know, we are kind of just patting our backs, yeah, really, just feeling proud really. and actually being, you know, led by commercial interest. I shouldn't say it on an entod yeah. platform, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> uh, but I mean, we, we should assess I mean, introspection and self, yeah. uh, you know, correction is something that we must, must always take a call. Yeah. Excellent, I think, everybody. Yeah. Really very good. Very good. Thank you, Dr. Chitra. Good Thank, you. Us. Thank you. Bye -bye. It, it was very good. Yeah, very nice. The whole meeting was very nice. And uh, thanks, Veena. Are you there? Thank you, ma'am. Yeah. 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 Congratulations. Yeah. All of you. All of us. Yes. Team ART. Great. Yeah. Great Thank job. You. Thank you. Thank you.